or hospital. Be sure to read this notice carefully. It lets you know exactly how your information will be used and shared and how your rights are being protected. And lastly, if you think any of these rights have been violated, you have the right to file a complaint. We're serious about working with you to protect your health information. Know your rights. To get started, just visit the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights at hhs.gov OCR. Your health information, your rights. Whether your health information is stored on paper or electronically, you have the right to keep it private. Those rights are protected under a law known as HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. HIPAA gives you important rights. First off, you have the right to see or get a copy of your medical records. Sometimes you might not be able to see certain parts of the full record, but you always have the right to ask. If you find a mistake in your record, you have the right to request to have it corrected. If you disagree with your doctor or health plan about certain information in your record, you have a right to submit a written statement of disagreement that will be kept with your record. You also have the right to know how your health information is used and shared. Now, your provider is allowed to share your information for certain reasons without asking you first, like when your doctors work together to determine how to best treat you when you're sick or to report the flu when it's in your area. But in general, your providers can't give information to an employer, for example, without your permission. And if you'd like to know who has seen your health information, you have the right to get a report. That's called an accounting of disclosures. HIPAA gives you the right to say how you want to be contacted. For example, you can tell your provider what phone number they should call to contact you and whether they can leave a message. HIPAA also gives you the right to request that your information not be shared with certain people or organizations. All these rights are spelled out in the Notice of Privacy Practices, which is usually given to you or posted at your doctor's office or hospital. Be sure to read this notice carefully. It lets you know exactly how your information will be used and shared and how your rights are being protected. And lastly, if you think any of these rights have been violated, you have the right to file a complaint we're serious about working with you to protect your health information. Know your rights. To get started, just visit the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights at hhs.gov OCR. Your health information, your rights. Whether your health information is stored on paper or electronically, you have the right to keep it private. Those rights are protected under a law known as HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. HIPAA gives you important rights. First off, you have the right to see or get a copy of your medical records. Sometimes you might not be able to see certain parts of the full record, but you always have the right to ask. If you find a mistake in your record, you have the right to request to have it corrected. If you disagree with your doctor or health plan about certain information in your record, you have a right to submit a written statement of disagreement that will be kept with your record. You also have the right to know how your health information is used and shared. Now, your provider is allowed to share your information for certain reasons without asking you first, like when your doctors work together to determine how to best treat you when you're sick or to report the flu when it's in your area. But in general, your providers can't give information to an employer, for example, without your permission. And if you'd like to know who has seen your health information, you have the right to get a report. That's called an accounting of disclosures. HIPAA gives you the right to say how you want to be contacted. For example, you can tell your provider what phone number they should call to contact you and whether they can leave a message.
Just see, man. Throw up in a beat. Item 4A, issue a resolution authorizing as amended and restating audit engagement agreement between the Oliver and the Oliver General Authority. Section 2.816 of the Home Rule Charter requires a annual audit of an audit. In August of 2019, the Council approved the resolution for a three year audit agreement with Paul Zulu and Oliver General LLP, totaling $126,000. The agreement was for external auditing services only, with an annual cost of $42,000 for fiscal year. The resolution did not include funds for single audit services or financial statement preparation assistance. The request for proposal from McCall and Jones did include pricing for additional services such as a single audit compliance audit. The city has extend, extended approximately $153,750 in FY 2019, 20, and 21 audits, which included the single audit compliance for FY 2020, and both single audit and financial statement preparation for FY 2021. The amended agreement will increase the contract amount by $93,250 to cover expenditures for FY21 and 22 annual audits and financial statement preparation assistance. Uh, the resolution will authorize the city to agree with the Colin and Jones LLP to conduct our fi the final audit under their contract for FY22 audit and revise the FY22 budget amount with an increase of $17,125 to cover the cost of the single audit and financial state preparation. I will add that this is the, um, as I spoke earlier, we will be bidding this out for services, but this is to work on the actual audit that they're preparing now. This is the final part of their agreement. So we have ample funds to cover this increase of beyond what we anticipated. Yes. Uh, Mr. Contreras. In reading this, I was a little confused. Maybe you could help me. We only had an agreement from uh, 2019, 20, and 21. So we were without an agreement for 22, and that's what we're doing now? I believe we've been working on renegotiating. Uh, we have been negotiating. There were some items and some charging issues that we've been working on, and we should have had this to you prior to an audit committee. may be able to speak on this a little farther. However, uh, in working on that agreement, it's taken us a while to come to a final amount due. There were some charges that we identified that should were not consistently consistent, and so our team has been working with them on this. And so, yes, we need this letter signed. Oh, okay. Want to repeat the question? He just he just asked about uh, the 2022 agreement. Is this something new, or or have we been working without an agreement for 2022? For 2022 uh, fiscal year, we're actually working without agreement. Because it was uh, the original agreement was for a three-year period, and that's all really we budgeted for. Um, there was no additional services for that, so that even with last year, we were kind of working without with additional services, but it wasn't in the, the total contract amount. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is our audit going to be done on time? That's ultimately my question. <laughs> um, we, we are doing our best to make sure that your audit is on time, that the city's audit is on time and done accurately and correctly. Um, so that is what we are all working towards at this point in time. Is there an estimated com completion date? Right now there is no estimated completion date. Uh, the auditors are working with us. They're planned to come into the site on March, the week of March 6th, March 7th, and be on site. Uh, at this point, they because of the scheduling and everything, was that the, the, the storm, uh, a lot of things were postponed and, put, and pushed back. So at this point, we are, we are striving, we are doing everything we can in order to make sure that the audit is completed on time. Item 4B, consider resolution, find, uh, resolution finding a bona fide emergency and authorizing a contract for emergency sewer bypass services for the area sewer pipeline crossing at 10 Mile Creek adjacent to Harrington Park in an amount not to exceed $210,000. On January 16, 2023, the city's existing aerial 10 inch sanitary sewer pipeline crosses over 10 Mile Creek near Harrington Park was found to have collapsed and released sewage into the creek. This is not permitted by TCEQ 
and is considered a sanitary sewer overflow and will receive one phase one discharge. Upon inspection, it was evident that a repair or temporary fix was not an option. The city retained the services of uh, Waco Pump, which specializes in emergency turnkey sewer bypasses to divert the sewage uh, back into the city sanitary sewer system. They remain on site for 24-7 managing the bypass operation. All reporting requirements to CDCEQ have been satisfied and there have been no signs of distress of aquatic life. A future agenda item will be brought to council to design and construct the aerial sewer pipeline replacement. So, just to make sure I understand, but there is hard construction that's going to be required for future projects. Can I ask? Oh, yeah, there's that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, is construction going to be required? Well, if reading I'm, this from what we see, we had a failure, and I'm seeing $210,000. I'm taking what I'm reading and understanding. Oh, yes, sir. There's going to be a new hard construction of, of this old aerial bypass. Yes, sir. The um, existing pipeline is not usable. It's ruptured. And so it will have to be replaced, and there will need to be a design. Okay. So are we in violation of anything from DCEQ? No, this sir. Time? We are not at the point that it ruptured or when it ruptured, uh, there was uh, wastewater that went into the creek, which we reported as, you know, per the TCEQ rules. And so we are not in violation. Okay, so does the fact that we don't have this, is there any kind of a TCEQ ordinance or rule that says within X number of days or months or years that we don't have it, that we must have it in place? No, sir. There is no rule to dictate that because it's being um, um, provided for in a regulatory compliant manner. It's going, you know, into the system. So we work as fast as possible to get it prepared? Yes, sir. Okay. As soon as we were made aware of it, we immediately started trying to get something in place to take care of it. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bradford. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and, and I do want to commend our, our staff for something like that and the reporting requirements and the ethics and then that can be, uh, I guess one of the things I was thinking about is like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna imagine a line going across and then the way I was reading, I was sitting there like, okay, it was affected by water, but does that, so it, it was, was a, a support that? Yes, that, exactly. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, it was so there support. was a support that gave way yes, sir. In, in 10 mile and, so what we're finding due to the um, high amount of rain events that we've had, that um, the banks are eroding away, which is affecting the structure support for these aerial pipelines that we have. And so one of the things that we do with all of the aerial pipelines is before an anticipated rain event, we go out and inspect and then afterwards. But um, this one happened to be located in the area where there's also, you know, a TRA uh, wastewater aerial pipeline. You know, it's on our radar to check all of these. Okay, thank you. No, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Contreras. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the six to nine months projection, is that to start or completion? Uh, actually, the... Um, the construction is to start. Oh no, that yeah, will be to complete. <laughs> okay, six yeah. to nine months to complete. Yes, that will be to complete. Okay. Is that because of the engineering and the construction delays that we're all going through? Uh, because well, yes. it seems like a long time. The, that's true. Now, so we are looking at two different options. Okay. We're looking at a you know our typical engineering design option. And we're looking at a uh, design and construction option. So okay. the design and construction would be a shorter time frame. Okay. So that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out, you know, right now as we speak. That makes sense. The, uh, the quicker, obviously, the quicker the better. Oh, uh, that was sure. a rental on that is uh, real on that pump equipment is really high. And then also we're considering other alternatives for the emergency bypass pumping as well. Because we realize oh, that's, you know, an exorbitant cost, and so we're trying to determine how we can cut down on that by, by using staff to okay. do some of the monitoring. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That concludes.
discussion of the consent item. So moving on to item number two, city council calendar, city secretary. Thank you, Madam Council. <coughs> so um, we provided a, a paper copy of the consent agenda for the next few months of content for you. And I can either read the dates to you or um, you can uh, view them at your leisure. Ms. Uh, Karen um, has put together the comprehensive uh, calendar that's on the top, and there <coughs> is the calendar that looks like uh, the traditional calendar that the city secretary, former city secretary, used to provide the <coughs> City council members, uh, is it necessary for city secretary to go through each calendar or peruse it at your own convenience? Any questions you have later, you can come back to city secretary. Yes, ma'am. Yes, oh, yeah. Ma yes. There, are, there are some highlights. Thank you, city manager, for that. Um, okay. So, um, the, the city manager has authorized the use of an application called Do It. And it's so that we can easily uh, call the council um, and sort of, sort of an open uh, way of not violating the Texas Open Meetings Act. And we can just get feedback from the council about their preference or their availability for specific dates. We're considering March 14th at 6 p.m. for possible board interviews. Um, council candidate orientation, maybe uh, February 27th at 6 p.m. Um, that's not using the or just mentioning these as updates to what you have in front of you. And then, of course, we have uh, reminders to the city managers about initial process and when the council. Just a real quick one. I was trying to see if somebody's there. Uh, we, we usually have Operation Clean Up and Bill and a couple of other things like that. So I, I was just usually the kids like to anchor them up. So, <laughs> so I, I don't know. I know we transition from a few other things. Just something to know. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that very much. else on this item, uh, we'll move on to our briefings and presentations. And the first one we have is item 3A. It's an update on our, on our government update. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So we have a new reporting tool for constituents, for you all, if you want to, staff, uh, the thing about this reporting tool is that what we're hoping it will do and what we truly believe it will do is make us more transparent, more efficient in the way that we respond to our community when they reach out to us for concerns, questions, anything like that, and to be uh, more efficient and transparent with all of you when you reach out to us for concerns and questions. So the way we did that is we purchased a, and Mr. Tennant mentioned it last night for anybody that was at District 2. It's called C-Click Fix. We branded it as our Duncanville when we rolled it out. Purchased it in November 21. We went live in November of 2022. There was a lot of building it, trying to get it ready to go. And then when we got close, we wanted to make sure we rolled it out at the same time as the new website. Uh, one of the things that it does is it replaces the old website's online reporting system. And kind of what we found there was that a lot of the complaints that were being put in or the requests that were being put in, a lot of times weren't even making it to staff. And so we went through, we tried to find the breakdown there, and sometimes it just wasn't getting to staff. There was usually a bottleneck of it went to one person, and if that person didn't log in that day, it didn't get forwarded on to the appropriate staff. So we picked C-Click Fix. This way, when we get any type of request, it automatically, we were able to create categories. Anytime somebody puts in a request under one of those categories, we have a box that goes to multiple people. They're notified by email automatically that that request is in there. And then we have a couple of people, myself included, who log in every day and try and make sure that 
those requests that are showing is open or they've just been acknowledged and there hasn't been a resolution to them yet, that we stay on top of it and make sure that we're getting those requests taken care of as they go. So I'm going to show you a few features. It is on the App Store and Google Play Store. So if you have an Apple phone, I suggest going to the App Store, look for our Duncan Bill, download it. Same with Google Play. Once you've created a profile, this will be your homepage. Another great thing about this feature is that it will allow you to tie in to all of our social media. And we, uh, Mr. Hamby and myself, actually sat on some marketing calls today and yesterday to learn everything that we can attach to this. And we can actually attach a lot. So we're hoping as we go through and we grow with this, that we can get things maybe like agendas, event calendars, things like that tied to this so that anybody who has the app easily has the city of Duncanville right there at their hands. Don't even have to type in duncanvilletx.gov. You go to the app, you pull it up. You can actually get to our website uh, from here. So that's a pretty beautiful feature. When you log in, uh, so you can do it a couple of different ways. You can do it as a requested list, but there is a map. Uh, the map ability does show you where some things have been reported. So if you're thinking, I, I could have sworn that somebody put in a request for Fane Street, but I just haven't heard anything on it. You could log in, you could zoom in on Fane, and you could see what's there. Uh, you can also go through the list and see if it's been reported as well, but the map allows you to zoom in on a location. When you're logging in, if you're putting in a request, you can actually, there's a search bar there, you can type in the actual address. And I've done it a few times. Usually by the time you get to the third letter in the street name, it's already generated the street that you're looking for, the address that you're looking to put in. This is an example of what our customers can see and it's also an example of how this ideally will work. So that one up top looks like it's what I'm doing, but it's actually this one down here, streets and sidewalks on Eisenhower and Drive. So this person put in a request that there was at the intersection of Eisenhower and Monroe, an inlet that is exposed, pipe is coming out, can cause damage to vehicles. So. Duncanville, this automatically assigned it to the service center because it's a streets and sidewalks issue and those are the people best equipped to handle that issue. They reported, we acknowledged the concern to the customer, thanked them for reporting it to us, told them we would evaluate it and two days later we let them know that the utilities division investigated the issue and found it to be a valve cover turned upside down which was then turned right side up, and the issue was taken care of. So ideally, it works just that easily. Now, there are going to be some cases, especially when you get into neighborhood services, where if somebody reports high grass or litter, something like that, it may take a little longer. It shouldn't mean litter, but high grass, we may have to let them know that we can say, we thank you for your request, but we may have to give them two weeks to get the grass cut. So we won't always see a quick close like that, but we should always see a quick acknowledge. And we can actually run reports that tell us how quickly we're doing it. Um, these are some preliminary reports that just show you the number of complaints that we received, number of requests that we received November and December. Uh, it tells you what kinds we have. So we have everything from code violation, animal control, a vague illegal activity, which I think we either changed or <laughs> removed. Uh, streets and sidewalks, all the way down to trash collection, tree trimming, or even a billing issue. So that was November, December data. This is January data. We started receiving more complaints. I can tell you we, uh, we currently have about 25, I think, unique users that are using this. Obviously, we want it to get to more than that. But through those 25 unique users, I think we fielded somewhere in the range of 140 requests. 
uh, over the first two to three months of rolling this out. Uh, we do have reports that tell us to um, not only how many we're receiving, but how quickly we're acknowledging them and how quickly we're closing. And again, that last number is sometimes not always the best indication of how we handled the situation, but the acknowledgement number definitely tells us how good we are. So we can also do a neat little thing and tell you what's going on in each one of your districts. We can go, yes, sir. I mentioned that we had about 25 new users. Unique. Unique users. Yes, sir. Do you know how many total users? Uh, we've got 31. The reason why I say unique is that we've got some staff mixed in with there. So when I say unique users, I'm really saying people that we know are not staff. So about 31 total users since the rollout? Yes, sir. And, and we, we actually, uh, out, Mr. Hamby and I, today, we're on a marketing call to just figure out ways to get that number up. One of the ways that we're going to do that is train our staff when we get a phone call and there's a uh, complaint or a request or anything like that, we're going to ask them, we're going to put this in for you. Can I get your email address? Can I get your phone number? And if they do that, then we can tell them, not only are we going to take care of this, but we're going to put it into our dunking room with your email address so that you will get an update. And then what our Duncanville will also do at that point is urge them to sign up as a unique user so that the next time, if they've got their phone handy, they can just punch it in right there. I guess my, my question was, you said, you said about 31 users total, <laughs> and then you, there have been about 140-something requests. So that means that you're getting multiple requests from, yes, sir. from users. So is, <clears throat> it, it, at any point, would we need to limit the number of requests a single user can make? I don't think so. Uh, the group, as like I stated at the beginning, the great thing about this is that would be something to consider if it was all going to one person. You wouldn't want to overwhelm that person. But right now, if somebody reports uh, tree trimming needed in a park, that's going to go to parks. It's not going to go to public works. It's not going to go to neighborhood services. They'll never see it. The, some of the administrative staff will be able to go in and check that and see if that has been taken care of. But it's not going to slow down our other departments by having them get every notification that's put into the system. So what, what's the top number for users that you can? Oh, there's, there's no limit. We, ideally, we would like everybody in Duncanville to have. Our goal is, our goal in this, as we talked about it about a year ago when we first purchased it, is it's a 311 system. It's the new 311 system. And a lot of cities who have a little bigger cities, they price 311, and there's a tracking system that monitors all requests. We get requests in a number of those, but this gives us an organized fashion not only to see the requests, it also, if someone hasn't responded to your request, it flags us and tells us this staff person or someone hasn't followed up with them. And so our goal is to get all of our citizens. And so we wanted to get all the clerks out, and that's why it's been a trial going on. But our goal is we will do a marketing and roll it out. We'll need your help to let your residents, and we'll give you the PQR code so they can scan and come in it because then we'll be able to track it. And then what you will receive on a, however often you want yours, but you'll receive them is an update for your district of what requests came in for your district. It will also, the good part about the map on here is if someone calls you, now you won't have to call me or staff. You can actually go look online to see, has this already been reported? And it will also help you to understand what's going on, but you'll still get a physical report from it. So taking it from, excuse me, great. We council members regularly get emails directly from citizens. Mm -hmm. So is there a way for when we get something, we ship it into the city manager and where does it go from there? Or is there some way for, we, like on the website, it says write the mayor. I get emails directly from the website, and then I have to kick those forward with an answer. Are, are those and emails that we individually get from citizens as council members going to be inputted into that system for tracking, or how's that going to work? Yes. 
we can. And in fact, I'll give you a perfect example. I received a phone call today from a council member with about four different issues that they wanted to have addressed, and they are currently in the our Duncanville system. They've been acknowledged, and uh, they've been assigned to the appropriate uh, department, and that department is currently working on them. And we can, I can on my end, if I wanted to, and if the city manager directs me to, when, if you send me something and say, hey, this needs to be taken care of, I could put it into our Duncanville, and I could actually put your email address as the person requested it, keeping it anonymous so that nobody says the mayor picked on me, and you would get an update every time something in there is changed. Yeah, sure. Speaking of anonymous, can you uh, can you expand on how a citizen can remain anonymous when they come in? On yes, that absolutely. System? So you can you can sign up for the system, and you need you do have to have an email address. Uh, I don't think they require you to put a phone number in, but you can put one in. But you can put I've learned this. You can put any anonymous name that you want to. If you want to say Joe cares about Duncanville as your name then that's your name. And it, it actually, on our end, when it, if we take a request from a citizen or from a council member, when we go to type it in as an administrator or as an internal user, it actually asks us, did the uh, person who put this in want to remain anonymous? And we just click yes. And it, we, we could still put their email address in and their phone number so that it can send those alerts to them, and nobody will ever know that they were the ones that did it except for staff. Second question. Um, you said that when somebody's turned it in, you'll know if no action has been taken by staff. Correct. How, how do you know that? It will still say open. So right here. This little icon up here says close because we closed it out. We have three options. One is open. There's one at the bottom that shows the open. It's green. Yes. Acknowledged. Open, acknowledged, and closed. And so if, if it is still open, that means that, well, we could have sent them an update. We could have typed in a deal saying we've assigned this to our neighborhood services officer and they are investigating. If we forget to click acknowledge, it will still show us open publicly. That's where the administration coming in, making sure that we're going through after a couple of days and acknowledging everything. But uh, you would be able to see open, acknowledged, or closed as the end user. And if it's transferred from one person to the next, it'll also track the whole workflow of where it's going. But how are you monitoring that so that you know they're open? Uh, that's, the case. Let's uh, say I log in every day and I run a report and I can run it by status, I can run it by district, I can run it for a certain date range, and if I run it by status, it'll tell me what's open. I can even go and on a further column down, I can see what is still open and what counts as overdue because in the system, it will assign us a due date for getting these done. And in some cases, such as neighborhood services, there is a service agreement, service level agreement, in which we should have certain things benchmarked by certain dates. And so it will notify them, it notifies us, so we can always go in and make sure that we're getting to them in the appropriate amount of time. Thank you. Mr. McBurnett, thank you. Did, did I hear you say too that you can take a picture and it actually like geocodes? Ge yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and then actually targets. I, I, be I believe that's correct. When you take the street, or if you take a street because your phones track everything you do, it's going to pick the location, and if you're posting it on there, it's going to pick where you took the picture. Suggestion in terms of informing citizens how to use this. Mm -hmm. I know in the past we, you all have done some videos on instruction, and I'm thinking it might be beneficial to have a video done like 
if you want to learn how to use our duck mill, do the video, and, you know, beautiful Mr. Mr. Hamby's beautiful face or your beautiful face. <laughs> it's <laughs> just, it's just a video giving it, here's how to do it step by step and get into this. I think that's part of what could really make this more and more available to our citizens. I think we've already got that in the works. That's great. That's great. Yes, we absolutely want to roll that out. One other thing I did want to mention that we learned today on one of our phone calls, this can also serve as a notification system to our uh, to our residents. So uh, we all have apps that send out those push notifications along with emails and texts. When people sign up, we learned today we can send out notices so that if we're in the middle of an ICE event and Republic Services says they're not going to run today because it could be too dangerous, we can get in to our Duncanville, create a notice that goes out to every single person in Duncanville that is signed up saying your trash will not come today. So that we can also target districts that I think that's what Mr. Hamby was going to. So if, you know, oddball thing, a tree falls in Mr. Mac Burnett's district and is completely blocking the road and it's going to take public works a couple of hours to get it uh, removed and it's going to be blocked off. We can target just District 2 for everybody that signed up for District 2 and say, here's what's happening, here's what's happening in your district. Great. Great. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, item 3B, update to the City Council on the FEMA Emergency Generator Grant for Summit Pumping Station. Uh, Ms. Sanchez. Good evening, and Mayor. Mr. Council. Council. Yes, there's what a couple of us actually going to present this. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Lauren Sanchez. I'm the Regional Emergency Management Coordinator for Cedar Hill, Duncanville, DeSoto, and Lancaster. And our office here in Dun Duncanville, so it's been a quick drive over to see you today. We're going to talk about the emergency generator grant that the city got uh, from FEMA through the state of Texas to put an emergency generator at the Summit Pump Station. So just a quick <laughs> overview. The city co-owns the summer water, the summit water tank with the city of Cedar Hill. Each city owns and operates its own pump at the site to provide water to its own city. The summit water tank pump station provides 28% of the city of Duncanville's water and is a critical infrastructure for that reason. Cedar Hill has an emergency generator on their pump station at the site. Duncanville currently does not. Uh, so because there's not one there, we need a generator. We saw during winter storm URI uh, with the issues that we had with water when we lost power at that site, when everybody lost power during that event, we couldn't pump water to the city through this site. And we got very close to having to issue a boil water notice because of that. Luckily, we didn't have to. Uh, so the city ha has known that we need this generator and especially after URI, we especially need it now. So grant funding, this project has been going on for a while. In 2018, the city actually got together and realized that we needed this emergency generator at the site. I uh, realized that one of the ways we could afford to do this was through a grant. So when a grant became available through the state and ultimately from FEMA, there's a grant called the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, the city submitted to put this generator at the site. Uh, unfortunately, we never heard back um, from the state, from FEMA on this. But it did go through council, a resolution was passed authorizing the city manager to sign this grant application, submit it to the state, and if ever awarded, uh, sign and accept the funds. The grant total is for roughly $200,000. It comes out to one ninety, and you'll see the breakdown in a second. But how it works for federal grant funding, as you're probably aware, is the government pays for 75% of the total project the city then pays for the other 25% coming to that 100% total. Because the city didn't receive a response for the submission that was done in 2018, 2020 rolled around, the same grant opportunity was available again, and the city decided we'll submit the same project because we still need this emergency generator. So it was submitted in 2022, again went to council on March 3rd, passed another resolution with the same verbiage authorizing the city manager to submit that application if awarded, accept the funding. In 2021, the city still had not received a response from the 2018 or the 2020 grant. If you deal with grants, you know that sometimes that happens and you wait a very long time to hear anything back. 
but the city still needed this generator. So Public Works proceeded with a design for getting a generator at that location. They allocated funds from the Utility Capital Improvement Program to fully fund the project. In May, on May 18th, the city awarded the contract to Dunaway for the engineering design of the generator. 2022, Dunaway Associates estimated that the project's total was 564385 You see that this is a substantial increase from the roughly 200000 that was originally planned in 2018. For a lot of reasons, the costs of equipment, the costs of labor have all gone up substantially. And also the project scope increased just a little bit of some other work that they identified needs to be done at that site if they're gonna go in and put in this emergency generator. So bringing us to the current time, uh, almost. In 2022, at the end, on December 6th, the state actually contacted the city, said congratulations, the grant that you submitted was approved. We said, wonderful, we love grant money. Uh, but as I mentioned, the grant that was originally submitted was for that $199, $120. Here's the federal breakdown, the city breakdown. So the city intends uh, to accept that grant award, but it is only for that $199,000. Right now there's a gap between the, one, the $564,000 it's going to cost for the actual project versus the amount that we're getting for the grant. So accepting these grant funds will offset that total cost that the city was planning on spending to put this generator at the site. Upon acceptance of the award, the city will then begin project work. And so the reason that we're bringing this to you today is really to update you on all of the numbers. And I'm going to now defer to our number professional. So Dean, if you would like to brief on this, if not, I can go over it, but I don't want to mess up any of these numbers. No, it's really um, pretty simple as far as uh, the grant fund. Um, what was available in the budget for this project is $632,000 over. And so the project cost right now is at 564. So there's a little bit of contingency fund budgeted for this project and the remaining unencumbered is 130,000. So basically we'll get $149,000 back uh, from the grant share. Our portion is the 25% that we have to match uh, and plus any of the rest of the cost of the project. But so this is in our, uh, our water utility CIP fund that we will be uh, putting this project and budgeting for it. So initially when I was reading through this, it kind of caught me that all this, we got caught not knowing costs had gone up, but looking at the number and knowing that the available budget amount was way over what was anticipated by Dunaway. So do we have money left over, which is that $130,000? Yes. And which after, is, which after is, receiving the grant, now it said, what Lauren was just talking about, upon acceptance of the grant. So are we still in that acceptance phase where somebody has to sign a piece of paper to accept that money? Correct. The city manager would sign, we'll send it to the state, and then the funding has been accepted. We can start the project. So do we? can we start working on the project even though we haven't yet physically received that $149,000? Yes, so we in have order, to wait. You have to, you have to spend the money in order to get reimbursed. It's a reimbursable grant. Yes, it's there a reimbursable grant. Okay. Right. And okay. we have the money. So we have 632. Now that was the key is it, it is in the budget. Yes. Because I, I was reading through and going, man, you know, can we do budget for 200 now we're 560 something like, you know. And then yes, and there's a project the set up for it that okay. we went through that and moved all the money so staff will be able to see in that project in the ledger uh, the budget for that money and how the progress is going as far as how much they're spending for the project. Okay. okay? Yes, Mr. Cummings. So, you know, we accept the grant how how soon after we accept the grant are we going to be able to start the work that will be up to your your project manager okay so <laughs> the um the generator actually has to be bid that project has to be bid and so we're talking about a 350 kv generator uh, automatic transfer switch we've got to do some pad modifications so we're at the point now of finalizing the design for the project, and our intent is to be at the job sometime next month, probably closer to the end of the month. And so it takes about four weeks, it has to be advertised for about four weeks, 
and then we have to come back, you know, to uh, council to get approval to award the bid. So most likely work will start in the June time frame. So now we're looking at another six months of cost increases. Oh, so yeah, well, <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Actually, after we bid the project, the cost will be locked in. Yeah, I was thinking the sooner we bid it, lock that price down, have that good generation available to us, we can begin work putting all the pieces to it. Yeah, Mr. Contreras. Oh, just real quick. <clears throat> do all of our, besides the summit, do all of our other facilities have the backup generators? Yes, sir. So this will complete? This will be 100% auxiliary power coverage. Thank you. And how else are other equipment? As far as like the pumps or yes, uh, yeah, we do prevent maintenance on them annually, but uh, we're slowly going through and identifying pump stations and facilities that need to be rehabilitated. <coughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Moving on to item three C, uh, land property update. Mr. Tennant. Mayor Council, good evening. Thank you. Uh, happy Mardi Gras. We basically, this is an update as you have requested uh, as we as we proceed forward with the land property updates. As we, as it says right now, we've I've been, uh, done the uh, we're, current, we're currently on step one where we're doing the uh, boards and commission meetings. Uh, we've had some successful meetings. Unfortunately, we've had one not successful meeting. That was the Neighborhood Vitality Commission. That was unfortunately due to an ice storm that set in. So with that stated, we're still in process. We still have time that we can continue to meet with them. There's a meeting actually scheduled tomorrow with the Neighborhood Vitality Commission, where we will basically present them the first interlude where some of you guys have the luxury of coming to. They'll get that first presentation, and they will proceed forth for receiving information like we did yesterday with the Keep Duncanville Beautiful, which they are working on their updates, and um, Economic Development Corporation also met. However, they have no updates to provide as well. But this process is still continuing to go on. And of course, you guys are familiar with the rest of the steps. If you want me to proceed forward with that, I can go into them, or we just skip through that. Okay, I'm skipping through it. I'm seeing no nods. All right, yeah. Okay, and so basically, I just skipped into the slide right here where Neighborhood Vitality Commission was met with the Keep Duncanville Beautiful, Madam J um, January 16th. And also playing an economic development, had a joint meeting on the 23rd, uh, where I think some of you guys were in attendance, were able to witness that as well. They're um, engaged and they're look, looking to provide information uh, to you guys as a body, not as individuals, but as a body. Another update that we had is on February the 12th, which was this past Sunday, uh, we had a, uh, excuse me, the Sunday before last, we had uh, the UTD students, which are coming down to assist us with some um, research on the dock, on the, on the property. We had the opportunity to actually walk the property uh, with them, staff did as well, to see the property and provide an update to you all uh, visually. And these are some of the pictures from the site as well that we wanted to show you. You've seen some previously, but just wanted to show you some of those pictures while we're out there on Super Bowl Sunday. All right, again, what, we're starting those initial boards and commission meetings. Uh, next up are the community meetings. We're just getting ready to schedule those up. Um, for March the 2nd is the first one. The 9th will be the second one. Those will be two public meetings that will be held in the Senior Center. The 23rd will be a Zoom meeting, which will make with the Zoom link is already out, uh, but we'll provide that as well. Uh, so that's where we currently stand. And again, uh, I'm just looking at my slides, excuse me. Sure. All right. And again, I can repeat these, but you guys have heard these two meetings prior, the steps uh, three through seven, which are the continual steps. We can focus on these more specifically as we move further through the step process. Any questions, comments? I have a question actually for city attorney. Um, we received I have received inputs from citizens on suggestions for the ordinance. I know that we've received suggestions from the ordinance from um, the Conservancy group themselves. So while this is all still going on, my question to the city attorney is, are you working as well on aspects of that ordinance while everything else is going on for citizen input? Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Man, we've received those and have been forwarded to me from include in the text changes. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, so, are we ever going to have to get the Parks Department involved in this or Parks Board? Because I know one of the part of the process was that 
Oh, you mean I can make an amendment to the Parks Master Plan? Man, I didn't say anything about the Parks Department or Parks Board in any of the process. That's a very good suggestion. We can add them as well, yes. Well, yes. to Mr. Kutz's point, I remember very specifically when we went through all this, the Parks Master Plan was part of the issues that we had to contend with. So, yes, yes, it's, it's absolutely mandatory that the Parks Board get involved with this. Definitely. Yeah, and then, so as far as the, uh, the recommendations that were sent to us, how does that play into, uh, how are we developing uh, whatever the text amendment is going to be, how are we determining? And that's the segue into our next, you can call it a goat, a pig, or a horse, but it's got to have the elements. And so we're going to decide on what the elements need to be to make the recommendation, and ultimately you'll decide what the definition is. You, the council, will ultimately decide what the elements are for the definition the nature person. So, said. yeah, we're taking that information, obviously, uh, we're looking at different ordinances from different cities, we're looking at different nature preserve definitions, some through, like, Audubon Society, and conservator <coughs> conservatory uh, uh, information, and coming up with what are the elements, and then ultimately, what we call it here in Duncanville, it's just a name at the end of the day, it's what the elements are. On there. So you, whether you call it a nature preserve or conservatory, it's what the elements definition of. So we've I've given all that information. So when we go out to put the notice together, we will ultimately have that notice. We'll go out to the citizens through a public notice and through the PNZ, and then ultimately you get to decide. Well, because you know, I just want to say because. Uh, you know, I did receive the recommendation for a green space preservation district. And for a nature preserve, it seemed like it would be the ideal um, designation uh, and with all the land uses that were included in there. So I, I don't know if the rest of the council had a chance to, to look at that. But I don't know if that, if that can be our recommendation. It's not your recommendation, it's your decision. The recommendations come from staff. They come from P and Z. You get the seven of you get to make this decision. Mr. Contreras. So, um, with the discovery that we've let the park board out of here, we're going to be able to squeeze that in so we don't extend this timeline out. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's part of the master plan process. The park plan is part of the master plan. So, boom, boom, and all these things will come together at the same night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, folks, we, we are running tight here. We've got about nine minutes left to go. We have a major issue still to be discussed, and that is the, uh, the dog, cat, goat. Uh, in well, well, so, I, and Mayor, I assumed that by your prefatory remarks, you're suggesting we need to do this later. I'm thinking so, because I'm not sure that we've uh, Chief Stogger, I'm not sure that we can cover this in 10 minutes. I don't know. Maybe we can try it and see how we can do it. Because yeah. and, and let me kind of set the stage for you. All right. This is not about these four goats on Main Street. That's a separate issue. And what, because we had anticipated bringing you amendments to the process to get a livestock animal permit. And that's what the department worked on, and that's the ordinance that I wrote. And then in the meantime, these four goats on Main Street come up. So I don't want you to talk about that. Because someone's individual property rights are concerned, and there's an individual case still pending, I think it's inappropriate to talk about that case tonight, since that property owner has not been notified to be here to discuss your decision nor is there anything on the agenda to discuss your decision with regard to that particular property. So with that legal advice, which I do appreciate, the inputs that I've provided that you all have in front of you, you can drop looking at the background, you can drop looking at the concerns, possibly, possibly not, because I think my concerns and what I have suggest for considerations can be discussed. Yes, and, and there's two things here. It's the appeal process that the department's going to talk, since they're the ones that govern the statute, how you file a, a permit, and then 
if it's denied, then the appeal process that we've suggested to you, that's one thing. The next thing is the substantive portion of the ordinance that we need your input on. And that's what, what I promote. Yes. But you did it in context of Right, and that's what I said. That's why I appreciate your, your giving me that legal advice because what I inputted with each of you have, and I understand it was late early this afternoon, I may not have had a chance to read it, that the looking at my paper, looking at concerns for consideration, those two pieces could be applicable to the discussion because they affect my thoughts were this is how the a future ordinance can be crafted with this in mind. Yes. If there's there's a couple of questions. Do you want to have livestock in your city? That's one question. Two, there's also prohibited animals, which you call wild animals, <coughs> uh, monkeys and snakes and all kinds of other things. So how about looking at with indifference to the time? Can you cover the salient points that the city attorney is talking about in like five minutes? And we'll stick, we're going to have to come back to this because I know the city council members probably likely have not been up and given them the opportunity to read what I input it this afternoon. Do you want to come back to a to different it. meeting? I don't know. I'm asking. Okay. Do you want to come back to this later tonight or do you want to hear what the Chief Stoner has to say? Do you have an opportunity to the digest what I've inputted and we keep going? Who made the motion to continue this, this discussion? Well, we don't need a motion in here. We no, no, no. I didn't ask for that. I was asking who, who made the motion to continue the discussion oh, on this I issue. I don't recall who that was. I don't either. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The thing is, Jeremy, and I think, I think Jeremy and okay. I second it. So you all okay with this? Well, to revisit the ordinance, and I, but I guess it's, it's difficult to have a conversation about it without because we wouldn't even be having this conversation if it weren't for that case. So I, well, it brings the case to mind that you allow livestock in your city under certain conditions. And those are generally goats, pigs, horses, cattle, burros, and some other. Most cities don't allow livestock in their city. Now, I know that people now have chickens. And, you know, you're a landlocked community now in 1982. This town looked a lot different, or city looked a lot different than it looks today. But, you know, that's up to y'all. We need to answer that question first. And then all this thing about wild animals. And, and then we, what we he a, needs to talk about is really council, a process. We as a, at the last city council meeting, we as a council were asked to provide input on our thoughts on the ordinance. Correct. All I know is I've done that. I don't know if the other six of you have. The other six of you haven't then city attorney and police department is not necessarily have you know full input from all of us. That's, that's my point. I, I do have input, but again, it's hard for me to provide my input without talking this about particular it. case. Well, then so, you need to get this case over with that's on the books now, and then, depending on what the outcome of that is, then come back and visit the ordinance. But can I say something real quick? So our sure. process right now, if somebody comes over tomorrow and wants a permit for, for livestock, it's terrible. What we're trying to do, if we can get at least what we have right now, if, if Chief Stogner can go on and give you what he has, we can at least get some feedback on that and start to work that. We can come back on whatever else you want to see, but but I, I think we need to get something in line. And we don't have to touch roll with what we got. Let's roll with what we got, knowing which we're on the <laughs> You got it. Thank you. Uh, any pressure here? Um, <clears throat> yes. So uh, this came up based on the uh, application that we received from the Reyes. Um, obviously, we reviewed this, realized that the current ordinance has some issues. Uh, we don't deal with these a lot. Um, in fact, this is the first one I've dealt with since being in my position. So we felt that there were some issues. Any changes to this won't affect anything as the uh, city attorney stated. So the current ordinance states that anyone can appeal the local health authority's decision. And the local health authority is the chief of police by definition. Um, so it's highlighted here. Um, would, and this is our question to you all, uh, 
based on that, um, would you like it only to re reflect that the applicant makes the appeal? That's the only person that has authority to appeal the decision by the local health board. So that's the first one. Moving on, uh, would you guys like to see the following additions? Um, application or the applicant is required to get their property inspected to ensure that it meets the elements of our requirements of its 5,000 square feet, um, any shelter meets um, our ordinance, just to ensure that it's humane. Um, currently, there is no inspection. So do we want to add, um, if it does not pass inspection, uh, we'll provide a written notice and a reinspection date. Um, anytime during the permitted year, any unreasonable number of complaints are received from multiple parties, the permit may be revoked. Currently, there is no such thing. This thing goes throughout the entire process that year, and upon reapplication is when these issues are brought to light. So these are the additions to the livestock ordinance that we're uh, recommending in addition to this year. So from there, the current appeal process is, um, it goes to the local health authority. If the local health authority denies the permit, then it goes to a board which also includes the local health authority, the chief of police who initially denied it. So that there's some issues there. Um, in addition to that, it goes to the fire department chief as well as the assistant city manager. So what we're looking at uh, from there is uh, once it, if that board upholds that denial, then that applicant then can appeal it to the city council, which you guys heard this previous uh, council meeting. So from there, would you guys like to see that appeal process change? And if so, in what manner do you want it to change? Yeah. Are you asking for your vote right now? Just whenever you guys have, well, yeah. Going back to those first three votes, you said I'd say yes. Okay, so these right here? There. Okay. I think and those three pieces are good. I want you all to understand, when you act in this capacity, you are acting in an administrative capacity, not a legislative capacity. Your immunity changes. When you go out there and pass the ordinance, you have absolute immunity. When you act as an appeal board, you don't have absolute immunity. So you're acting in a different capacity. You're acting in an administrative or an executive capacity. It is somewhat counterintuitive that you have this authority. Okay, now, this, to, to your point, this ordinance was written when I was out of law school, two years, a long time ago. So uh, this town was a lot different then than it is now. This is normally an administrative, if you were to go to Dallas, and I realize it's a million plus people, but if you go to Plano, if you go to a larger city, uh, even Farmer's Branch, I can take Coppell, I can take Richardson, I can probably take Lancaster and probably DeSoto, Council doesn't hear this kind of administrative thing. You write the policy. Do we want to have animals? If so, livestock. Under what conditions? And so the appeal really ought to be not change the ordinance, not to, you know, I was fussy at you last time. I said, if you pass this particular case, you will have violated your own ordinance. You can't rewrite the ordinance the night of the appeal. You can enforce it. So if there's a if there was a, let's just say that, for example, the police chief thinks that uh, based on the information that he has, they only have 10,000 square feet, so they can only have two livestock animal under the current ordinance. Okay. And so that goes to an appeal, and it turns out that the appeal is uh, they only have 8,000 square feet because the neighbor said, no, they don't own this land over here. It's not fenced in, but it did do. Okay, someone's got to resolve that factual issue. Not rewrite the ordinance, but so do you want to hear those cases? I would recommend to you, no. no. I would prefer that we send it to the Board of Adjustment, if you want, which could hear something like that, and they have that quasi-judicial aspect to what they do, and they hear other appeals instead of you trying to do something that you rarely do, and uh, 
probably are not. Empowered. Well, it it's somewhat sense. violates the, the charter in the sense that you're acting outside your capacity and overseeing an administrative function. So the best thing to do to boil this down is don't even talk about this. Turn it over to the people that know what they're doing. Let them come up with recommendations. If there's anything, it needs to come to us and change the appeal process itself. Or change the order. Or change, or change the order. order. Change the policy. You should be setting policy, not hearing cases. Right. Just like a special exception or other things like that that you have delegated. You don't hear things about the building code. They go to the substandard building or to the Board of Adjustment. That's what they're there for. So are you saying this case never should have come to us? I think the ordinance needs to be rewritten. The ordinance is written that it does, which is unfortunate. I've, yeah. okay. I've been coming out here 40 years, and this is the first time I've ever presided over a livestock permit denial in our city, much less even know about anybody having livestock. Shut the barn door. Yeah. So I, I owe you that experience so, and some of that instead of... So and we're and, and, and I've talked to the police department about this. As so well. the best thing to do, following legal advice from our city attorneys, is to not cover this at this point. Turn it over to the people who have the responsibility to analyze and give us recommendations in changing the ordinance and not touching a specific case. City manager. We actually have an ordinance. I just did not think we were ready to bring you an ordinance without explaining why. And so the ordinance has been prepared with, between the people in our police department. Um, with the things that they've recommended and he's recommended, but I wanted to make sure that you were comfortable with what was being said before bringing that forth to you. Not to extend this out, but I've got to say it. Um, but I agree with going through that process of getting to where it should be. But on this particular case, it's still it's still yours, it's still ours. So we're not going to deal with it tonight. No, but it's still it's only when you tell us to bring it back. And in the meantime. Those animals will remain in place until you take that case up. But from here on out, and seeing you struggle with this is, you know, it's difficult. Because then you're making decisions about how the staff handled something, what the staff did, yada, yada, and then so, it gets murky at the charter. So presumably, the next city council meeting, this is going to be on the agenda again for us to make a decision to, to approve the appeal or to deny the appeal. Correct? That's what y'all tell us to do. That's what we're going to put back on. Well, going on with Mr. Contreras just said, it's still, a, it's still in our backyard. To yes, make, sir. To make yes, sir. Decision. We need to make sure he comes out as, 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 as it's written right now. It's still the council's decision to make this. Right. And we can make the, and we, we'll the bring in the ordinance with future changes right. at, the, at your next meeting. It's complicated. I and, know we get, in terms and, of segmenting the brain, in terms of how we as a council operate and, on this one. And I'll important. recommend to you that you give it to the Board of Adjustment. And, and I like that suggestion, sir. It's Thank five you. members. It takes a super majority of them to grant the appeal, which is five out of seven. They've been great. But is the uh, hardship, hardship rule in play? No. Okay. So, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, from what I understand, City Attorney, at the next City Council meeting, our best move as a council is to make the decision or approve a decision to put this decision on this particular appeal back to the Board of Adjustments. No, no. you go forward because you've heard the case. Okay. And I think it's unfair to our citizens to change the rules. I want to rules. clarify because you're getting me confused now. No, I don't want to change the rules of someone that's in the process. That's unfair. Got so it. the Main Street case will come back to you for a decision. Good, bad, or indifferent. And then we will go on and amend either the next meeting or the meeting after with the new process in place. And we still have to have a discussion of how many goats, pigs, girls, if you want them at all. And I would also suggest to you about what I call wild animals. Okay. So, next city council meeting, we need to be prepared to hear the have another public hearing, I presume or not. Well, I, I can't recall whether you closed. I think you continued it, so we'll continue. reopen it. We continue. So we reopen it, and then council will be under mandate to make a decision on the appeal at the next city council meeting. And all those that have a voice in the matter should probably be notified. Those that are the adjacency issue, 
as well as the applicant and our code people. And city council members should be prepared to offer their input on how they feel about approval or denial of the, of the appeal. Yes. Okay, very good. All right, time stamp, 707. Move into city council chambers. If you need to make a quick stop, please do so.
Pastor Contreras. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your patience. We're going to get underway. Timestamp is, well, that clock says one thing, this clock says another. Apple time is 7.16. Convening our city council meeting for February the 21st of 2023. Thank you very much for being here with us tonight. The individual who was on the agenda to give us the invocation, uh, unfortunately, has not appeared, so I'm going to ask Council Member Mr. Kuntz if he would give us our invocation. Please rise. If you would, bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we approach you at this time with thanksgiving in our hearts. We're thankful, Father, for this opportunity once again to assemble as your servants and as servants of one another and as servants of this great community. We approach you at this time with humility in our hearts, recognizing that you are the great God and creator of all things and to whom we must all give an account. We ask, Father, as we enter into this evening's series of considerations and judgments and evaluating the needs of this city and its citizens, we ask that you help us to focus our hearts and our minds on those things that are, are good, those things that are right. We ask you, Father, that we act out of truth and honesty and purity of heart. We pray that you guide us in our decisions. We pray, Father, that you might be with us in our discussions, that we might be humble, and respectful, respectful of one another. We ask, Father, that those decisions that we make this evening might be to the better of this community. We ask, Father, that we make decisions that might improve the health of those who live here in this great city, that might improve their quality of life. And we ask, Father, that those things that we do this evening might be able to increase their trust in us. We Pray, Father, as we acknowledge our sins and our transgressions, we ask that you forgive us of them. And we ask all these things in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in pledges to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Thank you. Please be seated. Moving on to reports and our agenda. The first item is, is the mayor's report. I have a couple of quick items. I'd first like to say that I want to thank our citizens for allowing me to attend and, and purchase a ticket with citizens money to a summit on diversity. It was called Leading Different. And it was extremely valuable to me 
and to enlighten me and give a deeper understanding to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And those four facets of diversity are so important to every city and every corporation in the United States today. So I really, I gained a lot from that and being able to pass that on to our council members and staff is a great opportunity and I appreciate being able to attend that. The uh, second thing I'd like to mention is that uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Ginger Hertenstein Conley, who has been present for many, many city council meetings to give us our invocation, has retired. And so we want to wish her well in the next chapter of her life. Moving on to any city council members reports. Uh, Mr. Veracruz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a reminder that this Saturday is the Heart of Duncanville 5K run sponsored by the Duncanville Education Foundation. So if you get a chance to come out and just fellowship, walk, run, or uh, volunteer, we could certainly use you. So please help us out. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Any other council members reports? Um, okay. Raise your hand because my board is not working. <laughs> Mr. Mac Burnett, then Mr. Coon. Or Mr. Coon. Thank you, Mayor. Just very briefly, we had a District 2 town hall, and I want to thank the city staff for presenting, those that were in attendance. Uh, it, it was a good meeting, and, and I just want to thank the staff that presented and as, that as well. Uh, same thing as Mayor said, wish uh, Ginger Hertenstein Conley a, a wonderful retirement uh, as well. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Coon. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just wanted to thank the, the Parks and Recreation staff, one, for just all the, the, the great programming they do. Um, a lot of people don't realize how much work <coughs> goes into some of the events that they do that last just you know, an hour or two. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you know, my daughter and I went to the daddy-daughter dance that they put on on Saturday, and you wouldn't believe when you walked into the recreation center, it was completely transformed into a ballroom and, and I remember leading up to that uh, in the weeks leading up to that that Noel Garcia and, and the staff there were there ironing sheets I mean there were just tables stacked full of sheets um, there, there's so much work and preparation that goes into events like that and the event only lasted about two hours but it was a very special two hours and you know, I just wanted to to, to thank the, the staff uh, Noel and, and Bart Stevenson for all the great work that they do thank you thank you um Mr. Ms. Cherry, Mr. Kuntz, uh, Mr. Contreras, uh, do me a favor, uh, Council, hit your button to, to speak. Let me see if this thing. Ms. Cherry, got nothing. Leave it on. Okay, all right. I think we, we are back in line. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, City Secretary, please let the record show that Mr. Harvey is absent, Council Member at Large. City Manager's Report. Please join us for the celebration of Black History Month on Tuesday, February 28th at the Senior Center. Last year's celebration was a tremendous success, and we hope this year's celebration will be even better. The celebration begins at 11.30 a.m. with soul food appetizers and live soul music performance. Beginning at 12 p.m., we will have a fireside chat with leaders from our community who advocate for diversity and inclusion. We will end the program with another soul performance. Also, in honor of Black History Month, our communication team has put together a short video of staff discussing what Black History Month means to them and who has their, been their inspiration in their lives. Would you like to present the two videos now, Mr. Hamby? My name is Crystal Smith. I work with the city of Duncanville as a customer service advocate slash receptionist. I'm in the city secretary and mayor's office. I work with citizens across the city to help them with information. My greatest inspiration is my parents, especially my mother. She's helped me grow to be an African-American woman in this society that we live in today. She has instilled me to work hard through struggles and tribulations in life. She is strong and powerful, and she's helped me be the woman I am today. Black 
Streamlit is important to me because it's a celebration of our history, our culture, and what's been instilled in our bones over many years. It's brought our culture to the forefront and it's celebrated through this month of February. My name is Karen Smith. I'm a city management fellow for the city of Duncanville. I assist both the city manager's office and the city secretary. I've always aspired to be a catalyst of change in the law field. This has always pushed me to want to become a judge. Uh, one of my biggest inspirations lately has been Justice Jackson. She's the first black female Supreme Court justice. Black History Month is important to me because it's a time to build on knowledge. It's a time to remember the things that we normally don't always bring attention to, especially groundbreakers, um, history makers, just different people who have continued to be catalysts of change in the black community. And it's just important for us to not forget the impact that the black community has had on this nation in general. Thank you, city manager. Appreciate that. And to those two individuals and to our PIO office, putting those videos together, superb. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is proclamations and presentations. And I have the honor of doing two presentations tonight. Uh, you can see on the, our printed agenda that we are going to be honoring Ms. Linda Lydia and Mr. Kenneth Govan. Mr. Govan is on his way here, but not to delay. I would like to call up Ms. Linda Lydia. In recognition of Black History Month for the city of Duncanville, it is also my opportunity and my honor to honor a man and a woman in our city who have done such great things for us. Shoot. <laughs> this is life, folks. This is the way it happens. Um, I, I've been acquainted with Linda and her husband for quite some time after becoming mayor, and reading through her biography of what she does, it is a great honor for me to honor Linda as a champion of our city. Okay. So I have a, a proclamation here, and I want everyone to know that um, whether or not it's really important, I craft these myself. It is something that I do because I want to do and I ask for input, and then I put this together as from my heart to your heart. Mrs. Linda Lydia and her husband Bob are longtime residents of Duncanville for over 20 years. She has a servant's heart, evidenced by her long history of caring for others. As a volunteer with the Peace Corps, she taught rice production and English in Sierra Leone, West Africa. With Feed My Starving Children, she has traveled to South Africa, Haiti, and Cuba, she is a breast cancer thriver. Now, in Linda's words, a thriver is a term used for a breast cancer person who is still living with breast cancer. Yes, sir. That's important, and that's why that is in, in quotes, as you see. She is a breast cancer thriver of 28 years and founded Pink Diamonds, Survivors of Cancer Incorporated, with which the city of Duncanville participates in the annual Pink Diamonds fundraisers. Linda is chair of the Coleman AA Cancer Coalition and is active in the American Red Cross, Meals on Wheels, and Crossroads Food Bank, to name but a few service organizations. Mrs. Lydia also involves herself in our community by serving on various boards and commissions appointed by the city council. 
in her own words, for service to Duncanville, elevating our image as a great place to live and attracting quality services and businesses. For making a substantive and sustainable positive impact in our city, Mrs. Linda Lydia is hereby recognized as a champion of the city. As mayor of the city of Duncanville, I ask our residents to join me in congratulating Mrs. Lydia on this memorable occasion. Linda, congratulations. <laughs> And to accompany the proclamation, we have a medallion for the city. Thank you very much, Mayor. Go ahead. Um, to Mayor um, Gordon and the City Council and the citizens of Duncanville, it is truly my honor and I am humbled to have received it. I, um, I love this city and I truly believe this is a city of champions. I was so excited about the parade for our Duncanville uh, high school football team we have so much to be proud of and prideful of in this city. Um, I am, as Mayor has indicated, I am a 28-year breast cancer thriver. Um, I have had two double mastectomies. Uh, I am still going through treatment and pending some additional treatment in the next few days. But I'd like to take a minute to indicate to everyone in this room that my nonprofit raises funds strictly to donate to people who are uninsured or underinsured and that are going through breast cancer or other forms of cancer. So if anyone of my Pink Diamonds or anyone contacts you about contributions, please consider making a, a donation because it is a disease that has disproportionately impacted our city and our county and our nation. I'd like to recognize my, uh, my fellow Pink Diamonds who are my friends who helped so much in this effort uh, to raise these funds. I'm gonna start from the back of the room. Teresa Cox, could you please stand? And Gloria Garnett. Angela Thorpe Harris. On the end, we have Margaret Brooks. Sheila Skurlock. Gwenda Lowe and Leslie Williams. These women have been so instrumental in helping me raise funds. And we don't raise a little bit of money, we raise a lot of money. Last year, we came in third for Coleman for the entire county uh, in the amount of dollars that we raised. Uh, we have since incorporated a breast cancer uh, bike ride that we'll be doing again this year. And that is some additional funds that will be going to Coleman for research. It is so important that we try to do research and it's even more important that we provide support for those women who don't have insurance, whether it's to help them pay rent or to get a diagnostic test or even to get something as simple as a mammogram. It's one thing though to get a mammogram and know you have cancer but not have the funds to get cancer treatment. So the work that we do is God's work. And I wanna thank these ladies publicly because I could not be where I am because of them. God and good insurance. Thank you, Linda. We honor all of the ladies here with her as well, and Mr. Lydia. The next one that I want to honor is Mr. Kenneth Govan. Mr. Govan. It's very difficult to cite Mr. Govan's involvement and his accomplishments, not only for the city of Duncanville, but for Methodist Charlton Hospital, Methodist Health System. Uh, his resume reads about three and a half pages <laughs> of what he is doing. He is an extremely busy individual. I 
am honored to be able to call him a friend. <laughs> and now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we'll we got, up here we are. Yeah, we are. Yes. <laughs> You're not gonna make me cry up here. Okay. Not make me cry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, Mr. Kenneth Gorman, champion of the city. Thank you. Uh, okay. Hold on here. Mr. Kenneth Govan has been a Duncanville resident for nearly 15 years. Despite being the Encore Delivery Company's area manager, which I had to quote to make sure I got your job title mm -hmm. correct. Right. Yeah which is a 24-7 responsibility, Mr. Govan is an active participant in the city's business and development. He served on the Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee, which established the groundwork for the city's planning and zoning structuring for the future. He is on the Executive Committee for the Best Southwest Partnership and is the current president of the Duncanville Community and Economic Development Corporation Board of Directors. Mr. Govan is highly skilled in all facets of business communication and media and seeks to promote our community at every opportunity his civic mindedness is evident in his many and varied volunteer positions he holds in the area. The words he lives by are those of President Theodore Roosevelt. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. For his servant's heart, loyalty, and commitment to our city, Mr. Kenneth Govan is hereby recognized as a champion of the city. As mayor of the city of Duncanville, I ask our residents to join me in congratulating Mr. Govan on this memorable occasion. Thank you. Kenneth. And with this, is a medallion for the city as well. So, Kenneth, would you, you want to say a few words? I don't know how I, I don't know how I can go behind Miss Lydia, but we're gonna give it a good try. Uh, I thank you very much. I've been blessed to do what I love to do. Um, my job, my community has given me the opportunity to be involved and to make where I live a better place to work, live, and play. And Duncanville makes it easy. Duncanville being a part of the Best Southwest region makes it easy. It does keep me busy, but I am blessed to have my wife, Tamasha, who supports me and uh, doesn't mind when I'm gone a lot. I think sometimes she appreciates it, but <laughs> um, I am who I am because of the way my mother raised me, the way God made me, and the way she accepts me. So thank you very much for, thank you for just thinking of me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Tamasha, come, about, come up for a picture with him. Uh, let me go back to the city manager for just a quick moment, too, please. I must apologize. I, part of my report is I want to acknowledge our student. Uh, we have been fortunate to have uh, students from Village Tech who have been working with us as an internship for the last two weeks. And I'd like Ms. Celeste Simpson to please stand up. She is a junior at Village Tech. 
it's one of the unique programs where they offer the juniors who are studying government to spend two weeks working in local government. And so we have students all over our city uh, who have been following us. She has been working with Miss Jennifer and shadowing her, and she's going to be working with me. But this is an opportunity for us to groom our future city managers and directors. And we are just so excited about this program and the school giving them the opportunity to spend the two weeks with us. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to uh, do something very technical on a technical issue here, Council. Um, I want to ratify the city manager's time to exceed three minutes. So I will make a motion to allow the city manager ex post facto to exceed the three minute time limit. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Uh, Council, please vote on ratifying the city manager taking in excess of three minutes for her report. Unanimously passed. Thank you very much. And to all of you folks in council, thank you for indulging my emotion. I don't know where it comes from, it just does, but that's the way it is. Okay, moving on to our next item on the agenda is citizens input. Pursuant to section 551.007 of the Texas Government Code, any member of the public has the opportunity to address city council concerning any matter of public business or any posted agenda item. However, the act prohibits the city council from deliberating any issues not on the public agenda and such non-agenda issues may be referred to city staff for research and any future action. All persons addressing are subject to council adopted rules and limitations. And our rules by the Duncanville City Council is that individuals have two minutes to speak. The two minutes is timed by a timer there on the lectern and is timed by a city manager or city, I'm sorry, city secretary as well. I have uh, two cards. The first one is Gail Sliger. Thank you. And please state your name and address for the record. Thank you. My name is Gail Sliger. My address is 1405 South Main, Duncanville, Texas. I come tonight to speak on something that's very close to my heart. We're an aged community. Many of us have lived here for a long time and are older. Our, we have, we are blessed to have the finest police and fire department in this part of the world. Last year, across the nation, there were 60,000 police officers assaulted. We have been blessed in our community not to have a lot of division. We are now short because of the assault on police officers. We are short 11 officers in our department. We are short three firefighters. Having hired and trained employees for a number of years, I know what that cost. In the business world, not nearly what it cost us to stage, to interview, hire, train, equip our police and our firemen. I'm assuming that a minimal amount would be $130,000 before they are ready to serve the community. At $130,000 times 14 first responders would be $1,820,000. We have got to find the funds to support and be competitive with our nearby communities in our pay and our compensation plan. And I thank you for your time. Please give this serious consideration. Thank you. The other card I have is Grady Smithy. Grady Smithy, 1806 Cedar Hill Road, Duncanville residence since 1950. Well, about uh, a little over, a little less than five years ago, Gail Slager and I co-chaired the committee that made the recommendation to y'all of having, of the council, the ones of you that were here and the others the ones that are not, <coughs> that, that pat to be, for the biggest bond issue ever passed by the city of Duncanville. And it passed, y'all accepted it and the citizens passed it. 
But I'm a little bit alarmed at the slow pace of how we're getting things done. For instance, you know, we, we know that of the three, you know, road projects we put up, one of them we can't do because, you know, we couldn't get a, the, the, the uh, railroad to agree to it. Consequently, we need to shift that to, to, to over to where we can finish the last of the unfinished roads in, in Duncanville's system. And you all, all know which one I'm talking about. I've talked to you about it before. But my, my only question is this. Let's, can't, can't we move a little bit faster on some of the stuff we're doing? I mean, we've got, you know, we've got so many things that, that need to be done. And, we, and, and I, it's been my experience when I was sitting where y'all are right now in the 22 years I was there, that things didn't, the cost didn't go down. They went up, except for one strange year when we had, we had a little bit of a recession. Costs normally go up. And the longer that you wait to get some of these things done, the less money you're going to have to do them with. So my, my question to you is, can, can, we, can we please expedite some of these, these projects that we've got going in, especially the one over there that takes the last segment of, of, of Duncanville thoroughfare system and, and gets it completed. To do that, we're going to have to buy some right away, and, you, and, and we have the money to do that because we, we weren't able to do one of the three projects that we proposed. So that's my question for you, and I really hope that, that you will seriously consider that and do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item number four on the agenda, consent agenda. City Secretary, would you please read the consent agenda items? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Consent agenda item 4A, consider a resolution authorizing an amended and restated audit engagement agreement with McConnell and Jones, LLP. Consent agenda item 4B, consider a resolution finding a bona fide emergency and authorizing a contract for emergency sewer bypass services for the aerial sewer pipeline crossing at 10 Mile Creek adjacent to Harrington Park in an amount not to exceed $210,000. Thank you. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the, con to approve the consent agenda item. So moved. Second. We have a motion to approve by Mr. Kuntz, a second by Mr. Mac Burnett. Council, please vote. Thank you. Consent agenda items unanimously approved. Moving on to item number five on our agenda, items for individual consideration. Item A, there was no executive session, so we'll move on to item B. Consider an ordinance creating classified positions under civil service in the police and fire departments, providing for a pay scale under civil service, repeating all ordinances in conflict herewith. And to present this, Ms. Odie and City Manager, Ms. Farrell Bignabese. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you very much. Um, so before we get to the actual item in which you will be voting on this evening on the classification ordinance, we wanted to give you a recap of what we uh, previously had presented to you at the last council meeting. Um, what you have before you in, on, your, um, on the dais there is um, the uh, salary survey that we completed um, as well as um, what we decided to do is go back after feedback from the council and look at some different cities that are truly um, more similar in size and um, comparison to the city of Duncanville and to, um, and to refigure um, what that comparison would look like and compare to what the uh, city of Duncanville offers. So you have all of the positions and the surveys um, against these cities um, as well as some more uh, statistical data t in which we compare. But talking about public safety specifically, what you see here, um, utilizing these cities, so Bedford and Cedar Hill, DeSoto, Farmers Branch, Grand Prairie, because they are right down the road, Haltom City, Hearst, Keller, Lancaster, Mansfield, Midlothian, Rockwall, The Colony, and Waxahachie, okay? Um, looking at just those cities, this is uh, the comparison with all of the uh, fire and police positions. Um, taking that uh, starting salary, and that maximum ending salary, getting an average, and as you can see, in terms of what we, uh, the city of Duncanville, offers, we are 7.7% overall um, behind the average. This here, um, again, this can be found in the uh, document which you have in front of you for the police and firefighter section, uh, public safety section. Um, these are all of the cities, again, that we just talked about. Um, as you can see how we compare um, overall average as well as the best southwest average. Um, as you can see, just looking at the best southwest for the firefighter 
Our starting pay is at 63. The Best Southwest current survey average is 67 for a starting pay. For ending pay, um, for a firefighter is 79. For a police officer, that Best Southwest survey average is starting 67, and then um, the ending is 84. So the, the uh, item that we have for you tonight is the civil service ordinance. Um, this is the pay plan that um, which we are um, asking for you to approve. This is, as we talked about last time, that we have two phases that we are looking at. This is the phase one as of March 1st uh, step pay plan for police and fire. And the, um, the goal was to look at the ending pay. That is the strategy we chose to look more at the ending pay versus the starting pay. So the cost, this here also includes not just police and fire, but this also includes the general employees um, portion that we talked about. Again, we were asking for two phases. This is only the first phase that, um, you, that you see here. Um, with the March 1st implementation date, this only encompasses seven more months left in the fiscal year. As you can see, um, to give you an example of some things that we would use to offset this cost. So the general fund cost to implement these changes is 452,000. That is a fully loaded cost that for retirement and taxes um, for the general fund. Um, we had budgeted merit increases. That 300,000 will go to offset this cost. Um, and then we will have um, additional savings um, that will be able to absorb the rest. So there should not be a general fund impact for implementing these changes in FY23. So to give you an idea, um, right now should, uh, we have 10 vacancies, 11 vacancies in PD. Going into the fiscal year 23, we budget as if fully, as if fully staffed. We went into this budget year budgeting for four vacancies. We now have 10. Um, the cost of one police officer, the fully loaded cost, that's with insurance and everything, um, is about 81,000. So we have 324,000 that we budgeted just in um, the four vacancies that we had at that time. Question. Yes, please. Could you go over once more, one just for yes. clarification, yes. how the general fund at 452.280 is decremented by 352.280 to come up with a net general fund impact of zero? That was the difference between taking the 300,000 off and the re what was left is 152,000, and then we. I think what yeah. you're asking. So the 300,000. So when we started the budget, we knew we were going to be doing a compensation study early on, but we knew we would not get it till January. So we had in the budget, uh, in the general fund, 300,000 loaded for salary changes. And so that's the first portion of it. Uh, current fiscal year savings, we say the rest of it's covered by 152, but if you take 81,000, multiply that by 10, it's a little bit more than 152,000. So that is where the other portion would come from is the savings this year alone. Uh, and so that's how we're, we came up with the total of how we cover the cost for this year's implementation. So based on what you're saying and what we see here, there will be no merit increases, but we're going to do an across the board increase for civil service and staff. So what will happen is, and I think uh, I, it might have been missed slightly last time, uh, of our 141 employees, this compensation plan only impacts you know, approximately 75 general employees. I would see an adjustment. It would affect all civil service employees. But. So I guess I need to ask again, does it, does it eliminate yes. your authority as city manager to award merit increases because there's no more money because it's being obviated by what we're seeing here no sir and one of the things i've said to staff because i think the compensation plan was very important to them is that as not only do we see savings uh, within the police department we have savings throughout and so this does not prevent them from merit increases it would just okay. come from their budgets and as we're looking at our budget and letting them look at their budgets we are seeing savings across the board from vacancies positions that we just haven't been able to fill half year savings here and there and so that's where that would come from okay i just uh, wanted to make sure that yes merit absolutely. increases could still be awarded because they're but very very important there is one caveat i know that uh, one of the challenges we were having is because of civil service merit increases are not possible in civil service they're only possible for our our staff that are non-civil service so civil service as you're saying as we saw or will see steps 
Yes. We, yeah, okay, so civil service is by step, and there's no merit increase possible in those? No, sir. And they, and those steps by civil service are capped well, that's by what, document? Well, that's what we were also looking at. We're changing the caps, and, uh, and so what we've done is we've adjusted the civil service pay plan and each of the steps, and so they have, that process is set by state law, and so what we've looked at is each step. Now, what she did mention is, in talking to our civil service is yes we're focused on our recruitment but we would not have to recruit if we can retain and so we focused on putting more of our focus funding wise on those on the longevity if you look at our our individuals our folks have been here for quite a while and so many of them will max out and when they get to that seventh step I think it's in there when they get to the seventh step they're there other than promotion. And some of them will stay a police officer or a firefighter, and the only increases they receive annually are our cost of living. But because of civil service, this must come to council because it adjusts the pay plan when we do uh, cost of living increases. Going back to, flip back just one more, keep going back. To where the differential is at 7.7%, or where was it? Yeah, 7.14. Um, and this particular chart is first responders only, civil service. Yes, sir. So if we as a council approve what you're asking for in phase one, how close does it get us or what does it do to that 7.14 being below the average? It gets us to phase one, but phase two is where we get we close the gap. This is just the beginning. So how close... So How much of that of that seven percent gap can we close with this phase one? Uh, phase one gets us from sixty three starting to sixty five, and there is still another four thousand gap. Uh, let me go back and go forward. There we go. So here we go. So if we look at where we are currently, we are currently uh, let's use firefighters. We're at sixty three thousand. Right. Uh, the average is sixty seven thousand. Right. Our first step is to get to sixty five thousand, and then in with the budget process, we will bring this back again to get to the 67,000 so that we will be at the average. Okay, so that as we, you were explained, as we were explained last city council meeting, we were given this information as an update. Phase one, phase two, phase one's gonna cut it about in half yes. of the 7%, phase two is gonna make us in parity. Yes. With the, with the 15 cities that have been surveyed. Yes. Okay, thank And you. we did, as she mentioned, uh, I know there was some concern about the cities, and so uh, on the front sheet you'll see that we selected cities that by most population, we also provided information on their general budget, operating budget, FTEs, and how close they are to us, as well as the size of their community because we wanted to, to look at those that we think easily match. The only one that we left in and we left Grand Prairie in specifically because we look at places that our folks are going to and one of the big recruiters for our officers and firefighters is Grand Prairie and so that's how we came to uh, leaving them in. You answered my next question was why Grand Prairie was still in the, in, in the yes. list. Yes, one is. of the, when we first started this process, the staff would look to see where are people going. We do exit interviews and I, I will say personally I was at the Recreation Center and I saw some flyers for Dallas Fire Department sitting in our Recreation Center and I'm like, can't have them doing that but that's what we're seeing these other cities are coming we're training up employees for other employees employers and so what we're trying to do is make sure we look at salary but also what other perks that we can provide to them to make it and I think in my conversations with staff one of the big things that we did was we took away the overtime penalty and, and that meant a lot to many of them, and I think they are thankful for that. And we'll continue to look at other benefits, because this is just compensation that actually make this some place that is a tier one place to work. Okay, another question. I see your, your light, Mr. Coons, we'll be right with you. I know that, or we know, you have told us as a council that you do have one-on-one -on -one discussions with our firefighters and our, and our police. In those one-on-ones, have you discussed what you intend to do with phase one and phase two and what the responses are? Absolutely, I'm having one-on-one -on -one with every employee in the city, not just police, fire, public works, all, city, all employees have a one-on-one -on -one that's being scheduled with me for 15 minutes, but I've also done group meetings. So before bringing this to you, we have met with both police and fire to talk about what this looks like to make sure this is what they're looking for. And from my conversations, they feel this is a step in the right direction 
and they feel that we're listening and they feel that we care. Uh, I think there are other things that we're going to work on and come in the budget. One example is health care for spouses, things like that. So we are looking at what are the things that we can do as a city, but they are very pleased with what we're presenting today. Uh, my commitment is working with you all as council and looking at our budget uh, as we look at the phase two to continue it because we have to keep doing this. Now, what you have is a template. We will continue to refresh these numbers so that we know. And we're gonna have discussions and I'm having discussions with my partners in Best Southwest because it's very difficult. Uh, some of us have more money than others, but we are serving the same area, specifically in fire, and, and we gotta cap it out. And so I won't present anything to you that I don't believe we can support. And they support me in the fact that they know that I'm gonna fight for what we can afford, but we also don't wanna go beyond what our needs are. One more question. <laughs> <laughs> is affordable synonymous with support? You said, well, we can support. Do you, does that in fact mean we can afford support it? For me we can fiscally afford what we were asking for support for? My commitment to you and commitment to them is that I will not recommend anything that we would have to come back and reverse later. And as much as I'd love to be very aggressive in my estimates of what we can do, I can't be too aggressive that if we have something to change in our city, that I would have to come back and have a bigger conversation. And that's happened in the past where we had furlough days. So given our current budget, given our current revenue projections, and given where we are, this is something the city can afford to do. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kuhn. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. Uh, so just as far as the decision that we're looking at tonight, um, this, this, this will impact minimum starting salaries as well as maximum yes sir everything and everything in between right yes sir okay and then uh, second question I had was when we think about s retention uh, with fire and police how much does it cost for us if we, so if we lose a firefighter or we lose a police officer how much does it cost us to replace that one individual over a hundred thousand dollars with training recruitment and the vacancy loss <coughs> and that number goes up and so our retention process is the most important thing we can do. Uh, Ms. Gell mentioned that, but uh, police and fire will tell you. The training, the on-service training is very, very difficult. And the recruitment right now is tough. And there are vacancies even in cities with higher pay. Our folks in telling me they're here because they love it, they feel that this is a family environment, and they're happy with being in the city of Duncanville. And so what we have to figure out is how do we retain them? I love the recruitment pay, but I really feel that we wouldn't focus so heavily on that if we could also focus heavily on retention. Thank you. So you know, as, as we move forward in this process, at least for me, it would help to, to see some numbers for us to be able to compare uh, you know, what, what, it, what it really costs uh, for us to, to retain police and fire, what it costs for us to train them um, compared to what we're looking at as far as you know, these phases that we're looking at implementing and just c making a comparison there. Absolutely, and I'll add <coughs> that into my next presentation for you because I think that's a very important number. And, and it's not just, and I know we talk about in, because civil service falls under you, but our general employees, our public works folks, we get individuals certified in different areas and then they take the certification and they go to another city. And so that is a cost of, of what do we do. And so I will bring that back as a presentation to council because I think that's an important conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Contreras. Thank you. Um, <coughs> City Manager, could you, uh, I, I know we're talking about phase one here tonight, but could you briefly tell us um, how you anticipate, with nothing catastrophic going on, how you anticipate funding phase two? Okay. All right, phase two. Uh, we did an estimate of what would the cost be for phase two. Now, phase two includes a 2% uh, cost of living for all employees uh, other than police and fire. What happens with the COLA? Last year we did a phased COLA. We did a three, four, and five percent. Staff got up to five percent. And as we talked about the cost, that represented around $700,000 that we budgeted for COLAs last year. And we do generally for COLAs. Uh, the general employee part-time, one of the things we're focused on is we've got to move our part-time employees up because they're a valuable part to at least a $15 minimum. Uh, when we look at our civil service, the cost, total cost, that's, that's adding, considering that phase one has passed, 
uh, represents around 819,000 and then retirement and taxes for this are 197,000. That gets us to a grand total of $1.7 million. Now, what does it look like? It's between the general fund, utility fund, economic development, sanitation, and streets. Okay, so how do we cover that cost? Uh, what we're looking at is, as I mentioned, each year we budget for cost of living increases. So this would be absorbed in it, and it happens on an annual basis. Uh, it's varied between 2%, and as I said, last year up to 5%, some cities do 7%. In our general fund, that will represent about a $700,000. Uh, we also, in our last budget, had $300,000 for Meriden. We also had a fuel stipend. And so if you take that first portion of it, that gets us to about a net on the general fund of $341,000. As we look and project for the next year's budget, what we look at is how much money will we have available. We do know that we have our sales tax, which is continuing to increase. Uh, we get about 3.5%. Uh, we're allowed 3% uh, for our, our property values. And so generally we have around $2 million that we are using to do new things in, in city government. And that's how we would cover the cost of the next year. Now, what will happen is we will come back and have another discussion as we start the budget process because I will have a better gauge of where my revenue projections are. I'm looking at sales tax, it's still strong. We do have a major sales tax that's going to be coming on board that was not in last year's sales tax which is our new warehouse. That's not in our revenue projections, it's only in our property values, which happened last year, which we saw a huge increase. So we know that things are gonna happen, but we will go through when we do our budget kickoff and looking at the revenue projections. It also gives us a chance to come back and say, well, we're not sure if we can do this, and we may have to adjust it. And so our goal, though, is, as I started last year saying all things people, is to make sure that we are investing in our individuals, but we also know, and, and I, I, I think recruitment is a very important part, with 11 vacancies, we will still not be able to fill 11 positions by the end of next fiscal year, but we do budget for a full year because we could have lateral transfers. So I'm comfortable, but it will be a conversation that we will come back and have with you as far as the additional part, which is the 2%, because some of the employees are not covered at all. And so when I say 70, I still have another 100 plus who will only receive the 2% cost of living because right now, when we did the compensation study, they fell within the range in which they should be. Ms. Jerry. Thank you, Mayor. First of all, I want to say thank you, ladies, for all the hard work that you put into this. And I want to say a big thank you to the city employees for your uh, keeping our city operative, keeping our city safe, and keeping our city beautiful. And a special thank you to our police department and our fire department, because I know every time you go out to a call, you're putting your lives at risk. I know with um, being short, a lot of times you don't get to go home. I understand that because I have family and friends that, you know, do that line of work. You know, it's so easy for us to harp on that one thing that we did wrong, but we seldom get a thank you for those 99 things that we did right. So thank you for those 99 things that you've done right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vera Cruz. Right. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So just uh, a couple of things. Um, of course, you know my position. I've been in uh, public safety for 30 years now, but I think as a council, and this is just my, my review, uh, we're doing a great job because we're getting a second set of firefighting gear for our um, firefighters, which will help prevent cancer. We definitely don't want that to happen. We're getting new SCBAs, which are the self-contained breathing apparatus, which are the tanks they use to, to search and rescue in a house and put a fire out, right? Very important. We're doing a great job with the P25 radios for our police and fire. Uh, we're doing a great job with our fleet, got a new fire station coming, and on and on. But I think that's great, uh, equipping the, the person. But I think now what we need to do is equip uh, the retirement, which I'm really close to knocking on the door of retirement. And this is, this is where we get, get to this, right? We give them an opportunity to save, invest more, and do everything we can. So I know that uh, I may be out of line a little bit, but... Dallas, who I work for, just went from 63 to 71, so I'm just gonna ask for a little bit more, see if we can find some, and I know you will, ma'am, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. McBurnett. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think and hope that the city employees know that I am definitely behind your backs. Um, I appreciate what our firefighters do. I do appreciate what our police do, but I also appreciate what our city employees do as well because it takes that combination to make it happen. And Mayor, I, instead of just talking, it's just time to approve. So I make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve. We have a second. One thing I would like to do, though, is put up the chart actually that we are approving. That's it, right? Okay. We have we have a similar chart for fire, also, correct? That's police and fire. The red is fire. The blue. Oh, is I'm sorry. Okay, got it. Okay, so city council. That's why I asked. I appreciate the motion to approve and the second. This is exactly what we're approved. What we're approving for. So with that, City Council, please vote. We have unanimous approval. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to also express my appreciation to our firefighters, our police department, and all of our city staff. When I go back to Ice Storm Landon and knowing how many of you slept here, slept here in this building, slept in the rec center, slept on the floor to keep this city running and operating, not only for first responders, but for the operating of this entire city. And where is he? I saw Matt Bryant earlier. I don't see Matt here tonight, but or I know he was here earlier. To keep our water flowing, to keep our sewers clean, everything that happens, it is the innumerable feats of heroism that you achieve on a daily basis to keep the city in operation are greatly appreciated by all of us. I just want to make sure that when you walk away from here, know, as Mr. Veracruz has said, we will do everything possible, everything possible to do all that we can to give you the support, the monetary support, in addition to the soft support, soft skill supports necessary to keep the city as a city of champions as it is. We would not be able to use that moniker if we didn't have champions such as you all city staff, every member of the city staff, and every member of our civil service, fire, and police. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Item number six, staff and board reports. So item number A, receive police department 2022 racial profiling report. Racial profiling <coughs> report 2022, assistant chief Matt Steigner. Matt, the floor is yours, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, mayor and council. I appreciate the opportunity to provide you all with our 2022 racial profiling report. <clears throat> so we are statutorily required to provide this uh, to our governing body uh, by Mar March 1st of each year <clears throat> for the preceding year of 2022 or the year that obviously ahead of this. So motor vehicle stops, this is the stuff that we uh, report. Uh, motor vehicle stops which resulted in a citation, a warning, an arrest, and a search. So the analysis from the report that we received indicated that we're fully compliant with policy formulation, uh, that requirement, the educational requirement, uh, the racial profiling complaint requirement, um, the collection of racial profiling data, and then the report that we provide t -Cole. Um It's an independent analysis that we uh, contract with Justice Research Consultants. Uh, their analysis concludes that the Duncanville Police Department is fully compliant with all applicable uh, Texas statutes pertaining to racial profiling. Uh, bulleted in the executive summary of the report in page one and two. So with that, um, if you have any questions. Uh, Chief, one thing that I noted well, I remember going through this last year, reading it again this year, knowing that we are fully compliant. We That's appreciate correct. that, and we congratulate the entire police department for that. I believe the, the numbers were somewhere around 5,100 vehicular stops. And of those 5,100 vehicular stops, the, uh, the profile that says that we have done an excellent job in terms of making sure that there's no profiling going on. However, in, I think it was 188 of those stops, it indicated that the police officer knew the ethnicity 
of the individual before making the stop. How does that happen? I'm sorry, was there something? Um, I heard something, sorry. Um, it could be a variation of things. Um, it could be based on a call of service that we've received, um, indicating, hey, this uh, particular vehicle, the description, the license plate, occupied by uh, this particular person. Um, so those uh, type of stops, the windows aren't tinted, um, and they drive by us with expired registration. It's just a very or a myriad of things that could happen for us to know that person's race prior to stopping. So in the police officer's report, how is that indicated that they <clears throat> did or did not know the ethnicity of the individual prior to the stop? So after e any contact um, regarding a traffic stop, they fill out a racial profiling card, and that card has a question if the officer knew that person's race prior to stopping. Mm. Okay, all right. Uh, I also noted, as they did in the last report for 21, looking at the one for 22, the individuals who wrote this report made a very clear distinction that apples and apples are hard are hard to do. That's correct. You know, it's hard to say X number of whites, black, Hispanics stopped versus the number in the population of the city, the number of the population of the county, and Metroplex and so forth. It's very, very hard to say one is in balance or out of balance with the other. And I think it's in, it behooves us and citizens to, to read the report in its comple in, in completely to understand where these numbers are. Uh, because, yes, the executive summary in the pages one and two is great. But there again, as I said, looking through it, and I saw that 188, we knew that person's ethnicity. I didn't know how that would happen as well. So the, the manner in which the statistics are compiled in this is very, very important. And it, it, what it does is it's, it, it makes the report, how shall I say, it legitimizes the report with the statistics to see how those are compared and non-comparable and other pieces of the information. So thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, any other comments by city staff? Or my, excuse me, by council members? Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. No questions. Thank you very much. Thank Chief. you. Appreciate it. All right. Now, item B, our last item on our agenda, received the police department's quarterly report presented by Chief Levigny. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to give our quarterly report uh, from October to December 2022. Uh, again, we can't accentuate this too much, uh, but we are a recognized agency by the Texas Police Chief Association. Uh, we're accredited uh, by that organization. Uh, this first slide uh, accentuates our a change from referring to our professional staff who um, are civilians, uh, but we are all civilians. We're, we're um, you know, that moniker from, I guess, military and, and civilians. Uh, we are not militarized police department. We are a civilian police department. But oftentimes, the, uh, these folks have been referred to as civilians within our department, and we're moving to uh, uh, address them as professional staff. And, these are uh, those folks that work with us, that support our uh, mission uh, and support our police officers. Our staffing personnel, and again, keep in mind, this is uh, the last quarter. So uh, Officer Brandon Dunn completed his FTO training, field training officer training. Officer Jessica Detterman began hers. Uh, recruit Paul Becerra is currently attending uh, the Regional Police Academy. By the way, his uh, grandfather's a 41, uh, a retired 41-year Dallas police officer, so we, we hope for good things from uh, Officer or Recruit Becerra. Uh, we also participated in recruiting events in Dallas and Los Angeles, engaging with potential applicants for our January civil service test. Uh, just to kind of give an update on that, since we're kind of ahead in time, we had 15 app, uh, people show up for that test, and that's kind of the numbers we've seen as compared, and I'm an old guy, but almost 30 years ago, we had 300 show up for no positions at that time. 
So that's just where we are in the nature of policing today. Uh, staff development, our sworn personnel attended mandatory quarterly defensive, uh, defensive tactics training. Uh, Officer uh, Rahelio Hernandez received his level one active enforcement rapid response training instructor certification. Um, Detective Berger represented the police department at the Texas Association of Hostage Negotiator Conference. Uh, Sergeant Bird attended the FBI LIDA supervisor training. Officer Marshall attended arrest, search, and seizure as part of his intermediate training. And Officer Green attended um, the mental health peace officer course. So there's a lot going on, and this doesn't just happen in any one quarter. It's just we're oftentimes getting training. Matter of fact, I, because of our uh, time parameters for this report, I had the assistant chief, one of the assistant chiefs take out. Uh, in January, we did active shooter training um, with, uh, with school district and used the high school, and, and that's always uh, very beneficial, obviously. Uh, our regional care team has been up and running since I believe it's May, uh, as it says there. And um, uh, Officer uh, Hernandez, Ambrosio Hernandez, has uh, worked very hard with his colleagues from uh, different uh, agencies within the region. And uh, Officer Hernandez is here tonight, um, and he's worked tirelessly. Uh, some of the things he's told me he's done is uh, some things are outside of what normally we do as police officers. He goes and he's gone and sat with um, individuals as they sought treatment at various different times at various different places and uh, tried to make sure that we're taking care of those um, citizens so that maybe we can reduce the calls that we normally get in patrol uh, where we're getting repeat calls. That's what we're trying to intercept. And uh, as you can see in those numbers, he's done a phenomenal job uh, with his colleagues on that team. Um, he can expound more here in just a second. Uh, I'll give him a few minutes if, if he likes as part of this report. Uh, I think the council wanted kind of a report from that team, uh, maybe quarterly, so we just included that with, with this report. Would you want to so, do that now or wait until later? Let me just finish here, okay, and I'll fine. bring him up if that's okay. Sure. Um, our patrol activity comparison at a glance. Um, so from 21 to 22, same time period, you can see um, the numbers there. Um, calls for service go from 11,042 to 17,000. Um, one of the council uh, uh, men requested the top five uh, cited violations and those are shown there as well. Uh, go back. What's FMFR? Uh, failure to maintain financial responsibility. I'm sorry about that acronym. Uh, okay. That is an insurance ticket. All right, there you go, okay. It's no uh, insurance. Any other questions there? <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Citizens on Patrol, they continue to support us in our mission. Um, it, here's uh, the BMV report card surveys that they've done. Uh, we've seen a market improvement in the, this uh, report card rating. And we're, we're hoping to kind of, that correlates with what we're seeing in BMVs. Uh, it, it really hadn't caught up yet, but we stay out there and we we're stay at it. So. Our department activity for the quarter, uh, the number of use of, for, use of force incidents were three. They were all found to be within policy. Uh, pursuits, ve vehicle pursuits uh, were number two, and uh, they were within department guidelines, and we had no complaints. Our community engagement uh, consisted of what you see there. I mean, there's uh, in total, just off the, just kind of doing the quick adding, uh, what is that, 4,200, just over 7,000 uh, partnerships in, in various events. You see uh, Crime Prevention Officer Michelle Arias in a lot of those photographs, uh, and she's a big part of what we do there, but we do obviously get others within the department involved because that's what we do. There's not a job that, that I can imagine that's more, um, I mean, social than 
us talking to people. We look to influence people, um, hopefully just us showing up uh, before we even get out of our car. And we want to influence them in a good way. So there are NIVERS Group A offenses for the period. Um, I'll give you a couple of seconds to look through that. Are those numbers? So motor vehicle theft continues to be at the top of the list. 240. Theft yeah. Problem. yeah. And I'll show you a slide here that, uh, as y'all requested, or the body requested, um, I think a couple meetings ago. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that slide here in just a second. So here's the Group A offense count comparison with our best Southwest cities um, through the period and kind of what you'd expect given our various sizes. And there's um, the slide of which I referenced uh, just a few seconds ago. You can see the different um, quarters there throughout the year and how we compare to some of the other city cities um, through the NIBR side. It kind of begs the question in terms of going back to our previous presentation on funds in terms of what cities are included that we look at. So could you explain why some of these cities are included in this particular survey? You know, I mean, you, you don't see, um, you know, some we, we don't see Dallas in there. And, and, and some of that is just, uh, I mean, we could probably remove Cockrell Hill, Glen Heights. I mean, those, those numbers are um, in Garland, Mesquite, possibly, um, to get us kind of across the board seeing what we're seeing. But um, it's just what we kind of pull up on the NIBR site, and that's, that's kind of what we get in the, with this in the region. But we can pull some of those out if, if you desire. Well, yeah, my point is that if we try to get as close to com comparable comparison as we can, and thinking about Mesquite and Garland and uh, – and so forth there's kind of outside our neighborhood in terms of even the data uh, the number of vehicles registered in those particular cities or how those are, are compared. we'll take so out just Garland. think about that if you would okay sure. thank you all right it does make it a little crowded and we'll we'll uh, take care of that uh, just anecdotally um we um i'll tell you about a case that we had you may have heard about it um not too long ago, it may have been just on this side of the quarter, but with motor vehicle thefts and um, uh, so forth, we, we had a robbery um, at one of our pawn shops here recently. And just to show you how we're trying to leverage technology, this, this person who committed this robbery went in and stole long guns from this pawn shop, several of them, and put them in his car before we could get there. Uh, quite honestly, the, the attendees at the pawn shop we're, uh, we're surprised at this guy just walking in and, and um, doing this. And by the time we got there, he was gone. We had some camera footage, plate was covered, and um, except for a sliver on the left side. Well, we, when our folks get there, they get footage from various places inside the store of the suspect, was not wearing a mask, was wearing gloves but footage from outside from other cameras in the area. And then we ran that through sister agencies through their use of flock cameras. And you may have heard that in budgeting. We're, we're getting those and we're getting those implemented in this city, which will be a great help for us as well. But we ran that through and by the afternoon, our crime analyst did a great job and she supported us and ran that out, put a bulletin out we got information back on the suspect. This may be your suspect from another agency. And then we got information back on that tag with it not being covered, but we still saw that blue sliver. It was almost exact. We put it together, worked with ATF, and within a couple of days, we had that case solved. Congratulations. So here's October major crimes. Um, put out by uh, council district give yeah. a couple excuse, seconds excuse to me chief i want to make a quick comment on the if you go back one slide certainly and, and stuff and i heard the mayor's comments and i i'm i'm one that i do like to see that i mean I, 
I could understand maybe something would be going away. I'd probably like to see Lancaster on there, but but I I think as a region we ought to be seeing these things. So that's my personal opinion. Thanks. I'll I'll get with the city manager and, and we'll figure out what uh, she wants me to do with. It's pretty simple. Give him what he wants. Give me what I want. Make two different charts. Y'all can tell her that. <laughs> I know. I can't do that. I know. So, yeah, I know. Yeah. So, city manager, you can figure out whatever you want to do. Right. Give you a couple seconds to look at October. And November. One of the things as you look at, one of the things we, we've begun, and this was in the strategic port, uh, report the other night to see how we start to, um, you know, th throughout the city, put together, um, you know, response times. Not that we're just putting people in districts that are police districts, but where are we seeing the problem? So we, we've begun, it, it took us a while to implement it last year, and we've started to begin uh, a DDAX program, which is basically we're I um, can't remember the acronym off the top of my head, but it's um, deployment of our officers in areas that we know are issues. Now, that's a little bit more difficult when we're going from call to call to call because we're all over the city. But as our numbers improve, we're putting things in place that, hey, for instance, along a corridor, if we're seeing motor vehicle thefts, you know, that's where we're going to try to deploy our people in their discretionary times and their free time. So just understand that as you look through these. There's December. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Coon. S sorry, but, uh, before you go on, the, <coughs> on the, it's gone. Oh, the previous you slide. Go back? Yes, sir. The, the burglaries breaking and entering there along I-20, is that all r related somehow? Or are those all separate incidents? Um, uh, district I, five, I believe right? they're separate incidents because with the, um, with the Nivers, if, if they were one incident, one criminal episode, they would be tied typically in one report, Is that, if that makes sense. Whereas with UCR, we would have separate reports for each individual thing, regardless of whether it was a criminal episode or not. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh -huh. Mr. Contreras. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when you see an upswing um, or uh, districts that have more of uh, specific crimes like burglary in District 5. Um, do y'all make any adjustments to when you know there's more of that particular crime going on in that area? Well, and, and again, um, we, we do report this out um, in a council district format. Um, we have police districts in our CAD and RMS system, which they closely relate. We have four police districts and they're basically cut, cut the city in quadrants. So uh, they may not exactly mirror what, what you're seeing as far as a, a, a council district, but certainly when we see an uptick, for instance, um, uh, and, and this may, I think this probably accounts for the burglaries on Camp Wisdom going back into last quarter, um, uh, some of those numbers, because we did see an uptick in the burglaries, but we, we caught two different folks uh, on those burglaries. And, and took them to jail. Well, one we took to jail, and um, one had another issue out on I-20. Okay. If I could maybe rephrase Mr. Contreras' question just a little bit differently, knowing how the numbers indicate where more crimes are being committed, is there an effort on the part of, part of the police department to increase the surveillance in that particular area? We do um, extra patrols uh, when we see those kind of things. But once again, uh, you know, I, I have to point this out. Um, when we're going call to call to call, and a lot of these are two-person calls because of safety issues, uh, we may not be able to necessarily deploy people up there. We only have so many, our, our discretionary time gets reduced, essentially. But certainly, we do direct uh, patrols because we're seeing an uptick in certain areas. Okay, thank you. Yep, city manager. 
I think what we uh, just noticed on there, we need to make sure this matches the new census map because we did some adjustments with our census map. We'll fix it. Yes, ma'am. I apologize for that uh, oversight. And uh, let me wrap this up. You, uh, you saw, and I should have addressed it during the personnel, um, kind of advancing into this quarter. Uh, we have hired just this week, we started uh, two new recruits. Um, they will begin uh, the Dallas County uh, Sheriff's Office Academy uh, next week. So uh, we move from 11 to nine down um, on paper. Now, effective staffing is a whole different ball game because we gotta get them in the process of working as independent officers out on the streets. And that takes some time. Okay, thank you. Right. Any further questions of Chief? Sorry. Oh, Mr. Coons. Mayor, if, if we can, if it's okay with the council, I would like to hear from uh, the regional care team, just maybe just I'm a sorry. brief yep. <laughs> report. Yeah. Kind of myself. Um, we kind of went back and forth there for a while, so I'm afraid to give them this. But. Oh, no, we're good. We're good. <laughs> no, they'll do a good job. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Chief. Um, thank you, City Council and Mayor, for the opportunity to come before you again. It's been almost a year uh, since we have proposed this project to you and, and enlisted your participation. So we wanted to give you first just a brief update. I know they're passing out our little packet uh, to kind of give you a visual of what we're going over today. We just want to give you a reminder about who we are. So we are the regional care team. For us, care stands for crisis assessment, resource engagement. And so basically what we are is a, a free resource for the community. Uh, we are currently grant funded. We'll go into a little bit about what that entails for the future later on. And then we are interdisciplinary, meaning that we have a bunch of different professionals on our team that can address uh, situations from various perspectives. We primarily follow up on emergency detentions, or you may have, called, may have heard them called APOWs, so when police officers go out and take an individual into custody for a mental health crisis because they're an imminent danger to themselves or other people and take them immediately to a behavioral health facility. Uh, so we're following up on those individuals because we found that it's necessary to make sure that they are successful in integrating back into the community after that emergency hospitalization. We also a service that allows people to refer themselves or their family members directly to our service. So uh, people that may observe their neighbors or their family members uh, having crises or heading towards that direction can refer themselves or those individuals that they care about to our team. Um, and finally, our mission is, has to do with reaching out to people who are kind of notoriously hard to engage. So that's the crisis engagement part of our resource engagement part of our, of our name. So we know that people with behavioral health needs uh, think about people who are maybe homeless or substance users or who suffer from uh, perpetual mental illness. They may be hard to engage with resources that are actually available in the community. So that's part of a, um, a responsibility that we've taken on to go out there and just be a consistent community partner to try to get those individuals engaged with those services. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to your familiar face here, Officer Rosia Hernandez, who's been an invaluable team member on the regional care team, and I'll let him kind of go over some of the things that he's been involved with. Good evening, Council. Uh, again, my name is Officer Ambrosio Hernandez. Uh, got selected to be on the care team back in May of 2022, and um, it's, I was known as the mental health guru while on the street. Uh, in the academy kind of veered toward that as a passion. Um, I um, served four years in the Marine Corps, kind of didn't really know a lot about mental health, but law enforcement kind of gave me a broader perspective on it and uh, kind of just went down, you know, went down that uh, alley there. Um, see, uh, Lieutenant Franks mentioned how we get um, our, in contact with individuals through reports, referrals. It can be citizens, can be officers, so if that, if that individual they go to a call to didn't meet the requirement of an emergency detention at that moment, they'll shoot me an email. Uh, it'll sometimes be like a quick, you know, couple sentences, but we do have a referral form they can fill out that goes into detail with phone numbers, addresses, uh, family members, things like that. Um, the the officers are doing a spectacular job at submitting those in uh, to me. We also have a website, regionalcareteam.org. Um, where 
anyone can access, uh, refer a family member, gives the, uh, our goals, our purpose, um, things like that. So for the quarterly example, um, for October through December, we had a total of 63 clients that we interacted with, seven voluntary assessments with our social workers. So that's them coming to our office, agreeing to meet at a certain time, um, explaining their situation. Go ahead. So a total, with those 63 cl clients from October to December of 2022, that was 624 contacts. What those contacts entail are phone calls, text messages, home visits, um, courtesy rides to Metro Care, um, assisting them with moving from one group home to another. Um, and something uh, that we did for December was donating to a family um, with the funds that we had and um, that was a big uh, engagement there. Uh, we had, they wanted me to mention a success story. I'm not gonna mention any names, but a uh, officer um, recommended me to a family that was staying at one of our hotels, uh, kind of struggling with financial needs. Uh, no transportation. Uh, she, a middle-aged woman with a 12-year-old and a 60-year-old uh, uh, woman she was caring for. Um, didn't have a job, didn't have a place, didn't know how they were gonna get their meal the next day. Uh, we came in contact with them. We, that was probably a three or four month stint with them, trying to find them shelter, find her uh, applications for jobs. We, our social worker from Glen Heights, um, I, I would recognize her today, but she's not here. Her name is Dulce Martinez. She went above and beyond for this family. Uh, during her lunch break, she, she went to um, a Catholic charity uh, resource center in Glen Heights and got a $2,000 check for them to stay a month at the Roadway Inn here. Uh, working with the manager there, um, she gave them you know, a deal to stay there for a month, uh, helping us out and um, on, on the care team. Uh, so they stayed there for a month. After that month, uh, we, she didn't have any success and we didn't have any success uh, finding them shelter or a place for a living voucher or anything like that. So we took them to Family Gateway down in uh, downtown Dallas and they took care of them from there. Um, I contacted her yesterday just to kind of follow up. She's now working, um, uh, residing where she's working with her daughter and the elderly female, she couldn't accommodate her, but she is receiving services right now uh, with a group home facility from the Salvation Army. So that was about four or five months with them and it's, it kind of like brings in, into light th this program and what, what, it, what we can do for certain individuals and families. Um, the May through December quarterly report, just those, uh, I mean, just what the state I've been uh, serving, a total of 148 clients and 1,265 contacts um, have been made. Okay, yes, yeah, so uh, the training um, that uh, I've been um, conducting or, and continue to conduct with, with the uh, care team, uh, got mental health peace officer certified uh, through Waxahachie's course, um, continuous uh, uh, mental health and emergency um, response uh, to certain websites that we have. Um, and uh, Lieutenant Frank's here allowing me to be a part of our tactical unit um, kind of uh, our SWAT team. And I believe every person um, on our care team, uh, we, Glen Heights, Duncanville, Cedar Hill, DeSoto, and Lancaster, we all have a certain specification there and allowing me to do what, I, what I've always wanted to do, be a part of our SWAT team, I'm kind of bringing that tactical, um, tactical mindset to the office. Uh, speaking in uh, different scenarios with our, with our officers because we're a walk-in facility now and we all know, you know what's going on uh, around our country. Uh, anything can happen at any moment. So each officer kind of has a designated um, specification when it comes to our care team. I did notice in Chief Ludigny's report that Officer Green, I guess, has completed that um, yes. training yes. in Waxahachie. Yes. So the, the key purpose of that is, is when let's say our, our, our SWAT team engages, that they, those that have been trained, maybe all of them now, have an eye out for somebody who may have a mental health problem that could be causing the incident itself. 
yeah. which makes them more aware and brings you into in, into key contact with an individual. Y yes, Mayor. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to, I forgot in my excitement to address <laughs> you all this evening. I am Lieutenant Melissa Franks. I'm actually a DeSoto police officer, but I'm proud to head up the team. I have with me Raven Thousand tonight. She is a behavioral health subject matter expert, and she is our program manager. So um, just as a gentle reminder as well, we're all housed under one roof there in DeSoto because we're the geographic center for the best Southwest. We thought that was gonna be the best way for us to reach out to all of our communities and make ourselves accessible to them. So we are all under one roof there in your presentation. They're at a, actually a retired elementary school. So it's a very uh, good partnership with the ISD as well as a very um, non-intimidating location for our clients and their families to approach and, and come and see us. Good evening, good evening. Yeah, it's been a year, so I'm glad that we've had so much that we can bring back to y'all. Um, I wanted to echo um, his story that of involving the social worker from Glen Heights um, and really to show the impact that we have as a team because we do co-dispatch. So we don't go out on our own. We want that for safety, but also because we have those different perspectives. And so while the social worker from Glen Heights was special in, in helping that specific family, all of the cities are working together. And so to show the, the overall impact, for 2022, we had 630 unique clients, and so that's for the five cities. So the impact of almost six and six and a half, uh, or 6.5, 630 <laughs> individuals over those five cities is a huge number. That's a unique <coughs> number of individuals. These are all individuals who have behavioral health needs, and so that could be under a large umbrella of things that could be a mental health disorder, that could be substance use, that could be someone who is maybe not diagnosed yet, but we are seeing those signs of, of mental illness or other needs that are in our community. And our overall goal, like the grant was given to us, is to really make sure that we are lessening the impact of our law enforcement and other emergency service personnel in interacting with these individuals by providing that post pension care when we've already had a crisis, but truly that preventative care. So where it's difficult for us to tell you how many exactly calls that we interacted or, or we didn't happen to 911, that, that's one of the hardest numbers, and we've talked about that last time we were here, is because I can't tell you what I prevented. But what we can say is we had 3,739 unique contacts with those 630 people. That's, that's 3,739 phone calls or texts or home visits or walking the stages of advocacy through a doctor's appointment. Many times people know the resources that are in the community. Maybe, I don't know if, if you're like me, I've gotten to the doctor and I forgot every question that I had planned to tell them and I get in there and I'm like, sure, yeah, that, that sounds like a plan. When we work with these individuals and, and create recovery plans and we sit in those appointments with them and we say, hey, do you remember you were gonna ask this? Hey, do you remember you had that interaction with that last medication you had? We're navigating that system with them and then we're helping them and teaching them how to advocate for themselves in the future. So it's not a one-time impact, but a training impact for them long-term to where eventually what we want is for them no longer to need us. And so right now we are in the biggest stages of showing them that they need us and showing our community that they need us. So eventually, hopefully we're obsolete. I wanna talk about our future plans very briefly. Um, our grant period is gonna be coming to an end in April, um, but there's a few things that are going on. So we are in works with, uh, with Dallas County. We re used our money very responsibly, that $1.8 million that we were given, and so we have a surplus. Um, I would like all of the handshakes to be agreeable. We've been told that we'll be able to keep that surplus, but we're working through actually getting that in writing, right? Getting that official. But if we do keep that surplus, um, we've also asked for an extension of some additional funds, and we've also been giving the general green light that we'll get that as well, because it's a very small amount of money that we need to keep for a full another year of supporting this full team without any involvement from the city's budgets. What that would say is if they let us keep the funds we have and give us this very small amount to make that gap meet, that we'd go all the way in through April 30th of 2024. That's our hope, and that again, that is the gentle yes that they've given us, though that's not in writing yet. The second piece is even if they cannot give us this the small additional funds, that surplus would bring us all the way through 2024 with a minimal impact. Right now we are reimbursing your officer at 100%, so that's all of their benefits, everything that you, you um, bill us for. What that would bring that down to generally is about 75%. So we would still reimburse that 75% and no other impact. We would not ask you for any additional funds at that time. 
If for some reason they do not give us any additional funds and they do not let us keep our funds, we have already outlined a budget that we will be sharing that with you at a later time of what that investment would be if you want to continue with the team. And that's gonna be, of course, for funding the building that we're in, the supplies that we need, our utilities, all of those things to keep our, our vehicles, everything we need to support this regional concept um, and at what that rate would be for that um, joining of that team. So again, that'll come to you very soon. Um, what we've been told is it's gonna be very fast paced. They want us to present to the commission on April 12th. Um, what we have, what we need, and what we're doing. The commission's going to say yay or nay, and then very quick we'll be like, hey, here's, the, here's our yay or nay, and we'll be presenting back with you in May and letting you know what that budget is and what we need from y'all, whether that's just supporting us for another year or if that's gonna be a financial impact. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. McBurnett. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I wanna thank you guys for presenting today. Uh, Chief Levigny, I, I wanna thank you as well. But I personally know what Officer Hernandez is, has done, and I, and I have to commend him for what he's done because he is going above the, the call of duty, and, and he has made an impact. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Contreras. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, it's been a year. I remember when you came uh, here and <coughs> spoke with us, um, how it just clicked, uh, what you were presenting to us. And tonight I get to see it in numbers and see the person, Officer Hernandez. I couldn't be more proud to be a part of the council that heard the message, made the decision to go forward with this. And thank you, Chief, for letting them participate. And thank you all for what you do. We do appreciate all that you've done. And looking at what you've done, looking at the statistics, and looking at the three of you, that's the team, right? Yeah, thir 13 <laughs> of us. When we're all, for the whole building, there's 13 of us together. Yeah. Yeah. So looking at you and uh, your representation of what you do, we do thank you greatly because we don't understand how the issues of mental health affect our crime rate. And crime is perpetrated by individuals having mental health issues and having officers available to be, to see and understand where this complexity comes into play and then to call you folks in in order to assist in that is a great, great effort in terms of how law enforcement takes care of people. So we do appreciate you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Yes, thank you. Any other comments, questions by council? Seeing none, that includes our business for tonight. We are hereby adjourned at timestamp 851. Thank you, good evening everyone. <laughs>